doesn't affect the price of sushi. Stimulating late night sporting debate for long distance lorry drivers. Young mums. What time do you call this? Coming on? And students who've taken too many of those caffeine tablets. <laughs> the two mics, Harry and Graham on Talk Sport. Look at the light! Hang on, don't worry about time. This is very important. This yeah. is national security. Yeah. Got so loud that she complained about the noise mm. and she wanted to leave. Right. So I said to her, look, don't worry, stuff bread in your ears to not any, notify any the sound. particular kind of bread? Well, yeah, it was white bread. Was it a grain? I remember bread. But anyway, this is rather a tragic ending to it. She couldn't get the bread out of her ears and we had to go to that hospital in, um, you know, uh, <laughs> midtown Manhattan. This is Talk Sport. We are of the two mics, and I'm delighted to say it's time to say a very, very good morning to Mr. Mike, a porky, a parry. Very good morning to you, Mr. Parry. Don't you good morning me. What are you talking about? Don't you good morning What's me. Wrong How with you dare now? you? How dare you? I Thank see, God. I see you've recovered from your illness then. Ill, what illness? You had the illness all last week, remember? You kept oh, moaning yeah, and groaning about I had a very, very. Pseudo pneumonia. I had pseudo pneumonia, a very bad cold, but You're right so, now. that soon went with shock. The shock of the treachery you imposed upon me at Cheltenham. Treachery? I have just put out a picture on Twitter, folks, if you're oh, yeah. listening out there. You millions of you around the globe are about to learn about an act of treachery unsurpassed in the history of British broadcasting. British there what? we are. Sorry? British what? Broadcasting. Broadcasting. I thought you said broadcasting. I said broadcasting, I you sorry, idiot. Like, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that thing they do in Guantanamo Bay? Waterboarding. Yeah, it's something to do with that. No, OK. Well, what are you talking about? You need treachery. A bit of water. What are you talking Ram, about? What treachery? I'm talking about here is if you have a look on my Twitter account, you will see a picture uh-huh. of the ticket which I took out right. after my so called colleague came up to me conspiratorially in the Paddy Power box mm. that Hawksby and Jacobs were doing their show from oh, on yeah. Friday afternoon, the day of the Gold Cup, and said to me quietly, Jack Adam, and winked conspiratorially. Jack Adam, he That's said. That's not the kind of thing I would do. He'd been outside, he claimed that he'd spoken to several people in the know. I go off then to the tote uh, desk and I put fifteen pounds each way on Jack and Dan. Why have you called me a Judas? By the way, I thought that Excuse was me? a word that you, you were campaigning against last uh, week. Well, yeah, I, uh, to, uh, to most uh, people, to most people, it's worth campaigning against you. It sticks. Well, t- no, from your point of view, though, Judas is, is a, a very so, misunderstood man. So, so it's probably the wrong so, t- phrase, isn't it? So what happens is mm. I go away and put my money on Jack and Dan. We're all watching the horse on the balcony. I had money on another horse called Q Card, which looked as though it was going to win, mm. but then unfortunately fell. Yeah. And which horse the won? Porky Jinx. Which Don horse Cossack. Won? Sorry? Don, is that your phone making that noise? No, it's not. No, I'll switch it off. Don, Cass- Don, Don Cossack won, didn't Don it? Don Cossack. And, yeah. and, and who did you have your money on, by any chance? I had my money on that one. On Don Cossack? Yeah. So why did you tell me to go on I Jack I didn't Adam? tell you. I don't know. I don't, you must be hallucinating. I did not I, tell you anything of I the I am sort. not hallucinating at all. Have you seen my tweet? Uh, I have seen it, yeah. Right. Your treachery has been revealed. Why? I would like all our millions of listeners out there, please, to well, respond I mean, to the treachery. How much to did you win? To the devilment of this man. How much did you win? Well, I. Uh, what do you mean? How much did you win? Thirty pounds. So you won, but it came second. Well, you won money though. No, but if I'd if I'd have won one, I'd have won one hundred and twenty pounds. Why? Well, because I wouldn't have had to split my odds, would I, for each way for coming second? Well, I I'd mean, have got my each way odds and my winning odds. Well, you should have put it on to win. I'd have got a lot more. Well, I did. I put it on to win and to come second or third. No, I see. You see? Well, if you don't you understand, understand it, do you? Don't, you? If you don't understand betting, then you shouldn't be I down do there I do understand betting. What I don't understand is how I can be given the horse that's going to win with a tip and a wink and, uh, you know, you haven't got a problem here. I slope off, you know, quietly, not mm. telling anybody what I'm going to do because right. I don't want the price to be affected. Uh-huh. When when it wins, I can't understand... When you're, when the other horse wins, yeah. I can't understand why you're jumping up and down yeah. and I'm forlorn in the corner saying, what are you celebrating? Well, do, you we came the second. Inside, do you remember the you inside? You said, no, I came first. Do you remember the inside of the box? Of course. Do you remember the big white board that was just by the door. Yeah. And what was on that whiteboard? Tell me. Uh, Ruby Walsh's tip. Right. And which horse did Ruby Walsh tip for the Gold Cup? Well, that's irrelevant. Which you horse told did me you had, a, you, had, you had the inside word. No, I did not. I would never tell you that. Well, he tipped the horse that you put your exactly. money on. Exactly. That's why I put my money on it. Yeah. Uh, well, you didn't and tell it was me open that. open for everybody else to do the same thing. No, you... You just blundered around as usual and no, made a mistake. No, and you're trying you d- to now blame somebody else for you it. You deliberately tried to stitch me up, and you did stitch me up. And the reason I haven't cashed this ticket right yet... What do you mean you haven't cashed it? Well, I haven't cashed it, because I've still got it in my hand. Why, if I'd why, cashed why it. didn't you cash it? I'll tell you why. Why? I was determined to bring the evidence of this act of treachery back to this very studio uh-huh. to embarrass you, humiliate you, and un- 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 unveil you as, unveil a- me. as a cheat that you are, mm. uh, whilst 
Millions of people around the world are listening. I've got lots of tickets here, Your show actually. should be, uh, you know, complete now. I've got lots of tickets here. I bet on, on his own, because I thought that would do well, but unfortunately uh, it didn't. I bet Which on, race uh, was that in? Uh, it was in an earlier race. I think it was the race four. Race four yeah. is the Cheltenham Gold Cup. Oh, is it? Burke. Oh, well, there you go. So it tells you how much I know about racing. I've got this one here for Pasha Dupolder. Pasha Do you know who, who was riding that? Uh, Victoria uh, Pendleton. Yeah. And this is your ticket. You bet £20 on that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. She came fourth. Yeah. She'd come third. Mm. I'd have been all right. Now, West Approach, did you bet on that one? West Approach. What race was that? Uh, that was race three. Uh, I'm not sure. You're not sure? No. Uh, race three, also Gangster. Did you bet on that one? I don't know. Well, oh, you, you don't know. These didn't win. Uh, these, are all, these are all horses that didn't win. How do you know? Uh, because I was there, and if they'd had one, mm. I would have cashed them in. Yeah. Some of them may be yours, though. I oh, think some of them are mine. That's open, what I'm saying. Open Eagle. Do you remember that one? Open Eagle. Yeah, race three. Mm. Well, you see, he seemed to have a lot of horses in race three. Mm. And if you've got a lot of horses in race three, I bet you at least one of those will have come in second or third. Are they each way tickets? Uh, no, no, I can't tell. <laughs> of I course can't you can looking at them. You re- well, read what it says, you fool. <laughs> it says tote each way or well, tote to win. All I'm saying is, is that there is no way that I would have given you in any way, shape or form a tip because I don't tip horses anyway. You decided to back mm. Ruby Walsh's horse because These are all you thought each he was going to win. These are all each way. Uh, race two, Henry Higgins, all yours, John Constable. Ooh, all each way. Well, you would have bet on all those, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah I did. These are probably Where'd your you tickets. Where did you get all these from? They're oh, my tickets. I picked them all up from the box. My God. Maybe they all should be cashed in. Yeah, maybe they can. Do you not remember what horses you bet on at all? Well, I obviously remember, not. I remember some of them. Mm. I've got to keep these. Yeah, you should keep them. I've got to. Oh, mm. here, hang on. I know these aren't mine. Stake five pounds. I'd never put five pounds on a horse. Why not? That must be yours. It's right. too little. It's not enough. Is it? Open Eagle, couldn't care. So, how much did you end up losing over the course of the day? 300 pounds. 300 pounds. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Well, because that's ridiculous. What do you that mean, it's totally ridiculous. ridiculous. I mean, you shouldn't be betting that kind of money. Well, all I did was I my normal my normal uh, procedure yeah. is ten pounds each way uh-huh. on each race. Right, There's seven races. Right, so that's so uh, how do you lose three hundred quid doing 140. that? One hundred and forty. Well, I started doubling up towards the end to oh, get see. my money back. Oh, well, that's always chasing money is always a bad idea. But I lost more. Yeah, unfortunately, always a bad idea. And then we did spend a few bob on uh, a libation or two. We certainly spent a few bob on the train as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you think for a five hundred pound ticket, you'd get the old drink. Yeah, you would. Didn't get any free drink. But yeah, instead, they charged us eighteen pounds for a half a bottle of prosecco. Yeah, I know that was on the way up. Yeah, that was. God knows what it cost on the way back. I know. And everybody was flush with money except me. Except you. So anyway, you got to offer an apology, a public uh, no, apology. Oh, come not. on. Come no. on, come on. Uh, there is no need for me to make any kind of apology. I think, on the other hand, there are some apologies you should make uh, oh, yeah. on the basis of uh, our bus trip back from the race course. Because oh, you yeah. insisted on taking the bus back. Yeah. And then uh, insisted on telling the, everybody that could hear that we were going the wrong way. And people <laughs> were getting very fed up with you. No, and no. Saying, who is this bonker? No, no, I didn't. There were two Scottish gentlemen in front of us who were getting very wound up about it. No, right? they were. Yeah, they were. No, it was very good natured mm. banter, actually. Well, it was. But, I mean, I had to keep explaining to them that I was just mm. looking after you and that you shouldn't be paid too much attention no, to. Because no, as, no, no, no. as the station came into view, you yes. were still moaning that we were going the wrong way. Yeah, well, I, I, I. Where's the station, you kept saying? I know the way back to from Cheltenham Racecourse to the station very well. I've done it a million times over the years. And I did feel the bus driver was going by a circuitous route. Also, what did you make of having to buy a £2.50? tickets to get on that bus. I thought the bus would have been like a shuttle bus of some kind. Well, it was a shuttle bus. Yeah, we had to pay. I couldn't find a taxi anywhere, so I just got on the bus. But mm. there were millions of people on the buses. There were. Amazing. I'm amazed it didn't tip over. Because no, they must they make quite full. a bit of money. And I said to the guy mm. who was checking the tickets, I said, how many people do you have to employ to check the tickets of the people who yes. are supposed to pay £2.50 each yes. to get on the bus? And he went, we have to employ 40 people to do it. 40 people, yeah, well, there you go. Well, mm. anyway, look. Um, it was a very good day out, anyway. It was a very good day out. Thank you very much to Paddy Power for the hospitality mm. and to and our to good it. friends Paul and Andy, yeah. of course, for being in their box. And, and of course, they put you on the fool's panel, yes, which unfortunately uh, led to you making the incorrect prediction that Everton were going to win 3 1. Yes. Which uh, didn't turn out to be the case. Didn't, I'm afraid. No. What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong? Well, what's gone wrong mm. is... I don't mean what's gone wrong with you. I mean, what's gone wrong with them? Yes, I know that, yes. Well, we're, we're talking to Ian Bishop. He might be slightly more forthcoming. Yeah, I'm just hoping that our league form and our cup form are distinctly different mm. principles of uh, performance. Have you worked out what's going on with that yet, the semi-final? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a quarter past five kick-off on a Saturday night, Saturday, which is excellent. The, what, the 23rd? The 22nd, isn't it? 22nd? Yeah, 22nd, are you I sure? think. I think Saturday's the 22nd, mm. yeah, and I think... Uh, Sunday's the 23rd, okay. as I as I recall it. So, um, so the Crystal Palace game is definitely off? Yes, I was going to take you to the Crystal Palace game. Yeah. We were going to um, enjoy some hospitality down there, but I'm afraid that won't the happen 23rd is a Saturday. 23rd is a Saturday, so yeah. excellent. I, it's good to know, good to know. Well, that's when the Crystal Palace game is meant to be. That's Crystal why it's embedded in Palace my head. Crystal Palace game, yes. That's so right, how yes. many tickets are you going to get for it then? 
Uh, for what? For the cup, for the semi final. I haven't worked that out yet. I'm not really? sure who I'll be going with or when. You're not sure. Uh, no. Really? No. Well, did you not have anybody in mind? Well, I haven't got you in mind. Why not? If that's what you're thinking. Why not? I'm not taking you to an FA Cup semi-final. Why not? You're not an Evertonian. Well, of course I'm not. I don't mind taking you to, um, you know, a Crystal Palace game mm. because, of course, that's, uh, you know, that's a, a Premier League game and there are 38 of those in a season. Uh-huh. But there's only one semi-final yeah. and I certainly will not... Uh, entertain you in the seat next to me really? in a game like that right. when you have absolutely no allegiance whatsoever to Everton or any other football club. Well, I could support whoever Everton are playing you, you, just uh, to make it you, kind of a friendly day out. You are a plastic football fan. That's a that shocking is for thing sure. to say. And we'll be playing West Ham or Manchester United. Mm. Most people would say probably West Ham. No, no, maybe not. Manchester Saturday. United did extremely Sunday, well on, on, on uh, Sunday. Yeah. It was a, a thrilling performance. And whether that means they're going to have a late season rally or not, I don't know. Mm. I wouldn't mind playing Manchester United in the semi final. Mm. We played them in the semi final in 2009 and beat them. Went on to did play you? Chelsea in the final. Oh, yes. Okay. Have you seen mm. the time, by the way? Time is irrelevant when one is trying to sort out the moral basis upon which one works with one's partner. Believe me, the moral it has basis. come to me like a bolt out of the blue through my temple. Well, I'm very glad that you're feeling an awful lot better. It just goes to show that you weren't really that ill in the first place. I was this very is top Ill. sport. <laughs> Well, we are the two mics. Winners and losers coming up a little bit later on tonight, of course. There's been some fantastic sporting action over the weekend. A couple of tweets to read out to you uh, yes. coming in at the two mics. Mm. David says, free box, free drink, not capable of free thought, it would appear. Hashtag plank. Oh, that's very nice, isn't it? Uh, Thank Brad you very says, much it's, indeed. it's not Mike Graham's fault that Mike Perry made a load of bum bets. Mm. Um, uh, here's one from Steve. Uh, it says, wow, Porky has really upset you. I think he should apologise. Uh, I should apologise. Apparently so, yeah. Well, uh, what am I apologising for? The I'm fact that this man that. cheated me. I'm not asking for that. Daniel says, absolutely shocking behaviour from MG, mm. if true. Well, of course it's true. You've got the evidence. You've got the pictorial evidence. Well, but no. then Porky said it, so maybe it's not true. The pictorial that evidence, is true. evidence is there, Daniel, OK? Yeah, it's like that tweet you sent out earlier mm. tonight saying that you were here already, and I didn't think yes. you were here, because oh, I, was. I, I, I wondered if you put your clock forward. No, no, no. The, why'd you get here so early? Funny enough, I saw the programme that uh, Young Piers is on on a Monday morning. Um, what, Good, Good morning, morning, Britain. Britain or something yeah. like that. They ran their clock mm. an hour behind for the first half hour. Why? I thought the clock had gone back. I switched it on, you know. I was, well, it doesn't go back in the spring, does it? Oh, no. It goes forward. Exactly. I was flicking the channels, mm. and I thought, hang on, that's strange. And it said 6.08, 6.09. Yeah. So, what's going on here? Mm. Uh, it's very odd. It was in big red um, numbers, and the Are bottom left-hand sure left side of the screen. you watching something that you were watching no. again? No, honestly. Over cause, time. Because I was watching peers sort of try and take apart the Tory government over the, uh, the budget and oh, the yeah. repercussions and the sacking. Uh-huh. Sorry, the uh, resignation of uh, Ian Duncan Smith and all right. that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. So it's definitely there, yeah. Mm. Mm. Mark, a Liverpool fan, says this, Paul, yeah. you cannot be short of money if you're betting £300. Stop your moaning. When I go to the races, it's a fiver each way. Uh, yeah. And I'm made up you lost, he says. Yeah. What? what? He's what? made up that you lost. Man of the people. Richard says the Porky oh, curse strikes at Cheltenham mm. and at Goodison. Mm. Surprise, surprise. What? And Lee says uh, Porky looks well bladdered with his rock chick. Uh, £300 loss, man of the people. My backside. No, 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 no. The old rock chick lady. Mm. I mean, she just came up to me and wanted to, you know, just uh, be associated with me, I think. That's all it was. Shoot the breeze. Do you remember a name? What? Do you remember a name? I don't think we got uh, as far as that, really. Really? To be honest. Yeah. Why were you thinking Julia to her, then? Ju- oh, maybe your name was Julia. Yeah, I think yeah, it was. It could be, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah, the John Lennon mm. song. Yeah, Julia, mountain child. No, I think, to be honest, I thought, oh, she's a rock chick, <laughs> and Julia is a rock chick type song. You know yeah. what I mean? Lord yeah, Rallo yeah. says, we, well, we can see early tonight the Porkmeister is well and back on the Red Bull train. No, I'm not. I wish I was. Mm. But, uh, but you know, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> right, OK. Now then, what I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about. Mm. What I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about. Um, this headline that I'm looking at. Which about, one? About uh, Romelu Lukaku. Yeah. Uh, uh, going to Real Madrid. Mm, yeah. Well, not based pounds. on his performance of the weekend, I wouldn't have thought. Sorry? Well, not based on his performance of the weekend, I wouldn't have thought. No, you're Presumably not. they must have uh, thought about that one before the Arsenal game. Real? Raid for sixty million pound Lukaku. Mm. Yeah, but he has been very good this season. He has. In the previous game, remember, he scored two goals, yeah. two classic goals. 
uh, when we beat uh, Chelsea 2-0 yeah. in the Cup. Yeah. It says, Real Madrid will launch a £60 million summer road drive and rampage in hitman Romelu Lukaku. Yeah. The early Belgian tops Madrid's wanted list, smashing 25 goals in 37 games. Uh, we understand discussions between Lukaku's agent, Mino Raiola, and Madrid representatives are already taking place. Well, you see, this will then put a great deal of focus mm. on whether Everton have changed, because as you've often said on this show, uh, every club is a selling club. Yes. Right. So presumably if Everton get a great deal of money offered to them for either yes. uh, Romelu Lukaku or anybody else, yes. they will sell him. But they may not, now that they've mm. got this uh, you know, in, infusion of money from uh, uh, parts, un- well, not parts unknown, yeah. but uh, parts overseas. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the... Yeah, sure. No, 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 I take your point. Well, do you agree with it? Uh, I don't want to pass comment on that really? one. Really? Now then, Pep Guardiola seems to have been told, look, mm. tough luck, pal, if we don't qualify for the Champions League this season, there's yeah. no get-out clause for you. You're still coming. You're absolutely right. Crikey, that would be a bit of a uh, club down. Now, Well, what's you... got wrong, wrong with old, old Manuel Pellegrini? I mean, as I again, I'm sorry <laughs> to have to bang on about my predictions coming true, yeah. but when they announced all that stuff that was happening, everyone yeah. said, oh, no, it won't make any difference. A lot mm. of ex-footballers, mm. oh, don't worry, the footballers don't care who the manager is. Yeah. won't make any difference. I mean, Manchester City have fallen off a cliff ever since. Yeah, they, have. they have. Not only that, but he's changed his attitude, hasn't he? Because from being the the mildest mannered and easiest going mm. manager in the Premier League, you know, compared to some who stomp around and stomp out and all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Excuse me, when asked the question, what's happened to your disastrous home form? Yeah. He says, I don't talk about it. He only wants to talk about the game. Not well, talk. surely the game is part of that, isn't I it? I don't talk about that. Well, that's what Jeff, uh, what's his name? You know, the, Jeff, what's his name? You know, the pitch line man at Sky, very good friend of ours, very Jeff good friend Stelling. of mine. No, no, Jeff Stelling's the man who does uh, soccer Saturday afternoon. Jeff who, then? Oh, you know, I'm talking about Jeff uh, on the touchline, the touchline reporter, you know. I don't know. Big mate of mine. Is he? Yeah. Big mate. When was the last time you spoke to him? Uh, well, quite recently. Why are you making strange uh, 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 noises? No. Anyway. What have you been doing for the last two any, days? Any, the last time I saw you was yeah. quite late on Friday night. Yes, OK. I haven't uh, seen you since then. Just being in a taxi down the road trying to get home from yeah. Cheltenham. Now, what I was going to say to you was, uh, when he said to Mr Pellegrini, um, you know, what do you put down your, your, your decline in home form to? You know, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> and uh, just turned into AVB. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and Jeff said, "Well, this is a home game today, so mm. it's relevant." No, it's relevant. I don't want to talk about it. And then oh, he well, got, up and walked, then out, he got then. walked out. But in another press conference, mm. he did on the same within a few minutes. Yeah. He said, uh, "You can ask whatever questions you like, and I will answer whatever questions I like." Okay, you got it, and that was it. So yes. he's turned rough, you know. Yeah, yeah. he has. He's not very uh, well. He's not a very happy guy, I suppose. Well, I because... should imagine a bit of bitterness might be sinking in, mm. uh, if you see what I mean. Because when you, you know, when you've been so publicly emasculated, even though he says he hasn't, then you know you've uh, you, you've got uh, reason. To feel discombobulated about the whole indeed. thing. You have indeed. Did you see the Mike when... Ashley interview? Uh, no, I didn't. No, no I didn't. but I've been reading about it in the papers on the back pages this morning, I saying he's think... sorry he bought Newcastle. No, he's not saying that. He didn't actually say that. What I heard him say was yeah. that sometimes he regrets getting into football. Uh-huh. But that's different to saying I regret buying Newcastle. If you're going to get into football, buying Newcastle is a good idea. It's a massive club. Well, let me see if with, I can find the, great uh, potential. Uh, the, the necessary quote. But um, what the point I was going to make was the only mm. two times I've ever seen Mr Ashley on television was at the end of last season yeah. when he said, you know, a Champions League place would be like winning a trophy and I'm going to stick around until we get that. And in the interview today in which he said, no, even if we go down, I'm not selling, OK? But on both occasions, he wore a white shirt mm. with a um, black and white striped Newcastle United tie. Yeah. And I don't think, with the greatest of respect to Mr Ashley, who's a very brilliant man, mm. great businessman, billionaire, yes, businessman. very successful, yeah. I don't think men of his size should wear white shirts. Why not? Well, because they would be better off wearing a black shirt. Or a blue shirt, even. Or a blue shirt. Is that why you wear a blue shirt? No, I wear blue shirts because... Because of your huge size. <laughs> no. I wear blue shirts because it actually contrasts beautifully with the colour of my skin. The colour of your skin? Yes. Which is, how How would you describe the colour of your skin? Um, sort of pale. Fair. 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 And also... Pink. Also, no, no, fair. It's, pink. fair. it's not yeah, ridiculous. You've got very pink skin. And because I was brought up an Evertonian, my mother always dressed me in blue clothes. Yeah. Ever since I was like six hours old. Really? And I've been dressed in blue ever since. Blue clothes? Yes. What about school uniform? Was that blue? Yeah, it was blue. Did you wear a blue shirt? Surely not. You had no, to wear a white, white shirt. shirt. White shirt. Yeah. White shirt. Grey shirts, actually, sometimes. Grey? Grey shirts, mm, yeah. My something. school uniform when I was a, mm. a youngster, yeah. Right. 
but um, mostly blue. No, I see. Mm. Well, why don't you think? Why don't you think you should wear what? a white shirt? I think white white is a very very good colour to wear. Well, I mean, most people look better in a white shirt than they do in any other no, colour. All I would see. Yeah, oh, look, see the pictures on our internal monitors yeah. there, right? He looks fine in a white shirt. Now then, uh, I'll tell you what I didn't didn't think worked was Rafa Benitez at the weekend wearing a striped shirt with a striped tie. Oh, uh, was he? Yeah, well, I didn't notice that. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say is, men of a certain size shouldn't wear white shirts. What That's size all I'm saying. would that be? Large. Size X. Oh, listen, I've got something to tell you. Now, I mean, you know, you know, you keep going on and uh, taking the mickey out of me. What size is your shirt? And all well, I'm just right? asking you a question, which yeah. you don't seem to be able to answer. Guess, guess what I, uh, guess what I discovered over the weekend. Mm. Go on. Here, you are. read that headline. It says men are getting so fat, stores have to sell five XL size yeah, clothes. Yeah, five X's. So you know, you go into like Marks and Spencer mm. or something like that, and then mm. you go to the shirt rack. Yeah. You know, and think, oh, that's a nice shirt. Yeah. Have they got it my size? Uh-huh. And it goes from S for small. Yeah. M for medium, yeah. L for large, yes. and then X L for extra large, right. and then well, all the now, way through until five now, X's. Now apparently you can get ridiculous. an X X X X mm. X L. It's ridiculous. But you can isn't still it? get an X somewhere in the middle of all that. Yeah, you probably can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can. Yeah, that's what I do. Mm. Uh, it's expanded big and tall ranges for men. Now fits a size, you know, sixty-two to sixty-four chest, right? Yeah. So that's gargantuan. That, that is. is very large. And a twenty-inch collar, mm. gargantuan. Yeah, that is. Big. One in nine menswear items bought at the high street chain are now in sizes larger than double uh, XL, mm. XXL. Yeah, but they never say how many they're selling. I mean, they might just be making a kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 a sop to people who are slightly bigger than extra large. Which so fits they can a get 50 to 52 inch chest and an 18 inch collar. Yeah. The store said demand for roomier sizes had grown 170% in the last two years. Doesn't mean anything unless you know the numbers. Though, prompting, does it? prompting, 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 um, prompting it to expand its prompting. sizes. From 3XL to 4XL yeah, yeah. and now 5XL. But it's gone up, what, 170%? 170. You know, that's, that's, that means that, you know, if, if there were four people ordering them before, now yes. there's still less than ten. By the way, this is a Debenhams, not Marks & Spencer. Oh, right. This is a Debenhams. Mm. Now, Debenhams... Do you is shop like, at Debenhams much? I do. Do you? I do. There's a Debenhams in uh, Surrey, where I live. Is there? And there's a Debenhams in Portsmouth. What was the last thing you bought there? Uh, Debenhams? Yeah. Um, I think I bought a summer jacket there last oh, year. really? Mm, yes. Was that blue? It was green, actually. Green? Mm. That's unusual. I haven't seen you wearing that. It was kind of... No, it was kind of olive green. Really? I Not like, like the Masters. Are hey? you walking around like you've won the Masters? No, that's, that's uh, Lincoln <laughs> green. No, no, it's olive green, and it looks like a dirty green, so I don't wear it. It's, right. Actually, I don't How know How much you pay for that? About ooh, 120 quid. Really? Something like that. It's not much of a jacket. Well, no, it's a casual thing, you know, it's casual. Oh, casual. you mean it's like a safari jacket? No, it's like a wind cheater, I suppose. No, right. Used to call them in the old days. Oh, I see, OK. Anyway, it says... Well, we have more time now. It's, it, listen, this is important. Nah. While the retailer already sells a small selection of 5XL and 6XL tracksuit bottoms, yeah. its new range will expand its extra-large men's mm. clothing to include suits, shirts, jackets and trousers. The world is getting too fat! I'm telling you, what Debenham should do, in my opinion, is ban people of that size from entering the store. <laughs> Not count out of fat people and, and produce bigger clothes. Calm down. That's what will keep the world Just calm more down healthy. and look at the time, because it's, uh, it's running late already. Uh, we've got lots more to do. Ian Bishop's coming up in a little while. This is Talk Sport. Colin Murray, weekday mornings from 10 on Talk Sport with Wix. Every weekday morning, get opinionated comment. Who play? <laughs> no, exactly. I think I've played more for Spurs than he has. Exclusive interviews. You seem bolts. I always know what I need to do, so when I go there, I just get it done. And unmissable debate. People in the street like me, and that's enough. Yeah, mm. that's what all losers say. From the biggest <laughs> names in sports broadcasting every day. Unbelievable breathtaking stuff. Colin Murray, weekday mornings from 10 on Talk Sport with Wix. Let's do it right. So what does a good teacher make? My teacher makes me want to put my hand up as fast as I can in class. My teacher makes me believe that I can be the best I really can. <laughs> my teacher just made me realise that not all subjects are bad. <laughs> make a difference to thousands of lives, including your own. Tax-free bursaries are available to help you while you train. Teaching. Your future. Their future. Search Change to Teaching. Anniversaries subject to eligibility. Time for a new 16-plate van. Time for a Mercedes-Benz Citan, Vito or Sprinter. How about 0% APR and a service plan for just £10 a month across the whole model range? There's never been a better time than this March to drive away with a new 16-plate Mercedes-Benz van. Clock's ticking. 
Find out more at mbvans.co.uk. Business users only. Higher purchase only. Maximum term 36 months. Minimum deposit 20%. VAT at 20% applies. Credit approvals by 31st of March 2016. Mercedes-Benz Finance. The family member who was concerned. The neighbour who felt uneasy. The teacher who was worried. The coach who noticed at practice. And you. Together, we can tackle child abuse. If you suspect child abuse, visit gov.uk forward slash report child abuse to find out who to call. Transfer fees up. Season tickets up. High prices up. Why the blooming heck are you still up? Topical sport and debate worth staying awake for. The two mics. All night long. On Talk Sport. All night long. Talk Sport, we are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on, of course. Uh, Ash in Essex says, yes, again, old MG gerrymandering the Cheltenham betting to get one over on the Porkmeister. What mm. a disgrace. It is. That he says, Team Porky. Well, I mean, I'm Thank sorry. You. If you Thank can't you. go to a uh, betting establishment mm. or a race course and make your own decisions, I mean, I wouldn't blame you for any of the picks that I made. And I certainly did no. not in any way, shape or form come up to you uh, slyly winking and kind of, you know, going, I've got this yes, tip. Because it's not the sort of thing I would yes, do. you did. I've put out the picture to prove it. Mm. Why would I have gone and bet on the horse that I bet on when you went and bet on the well, horse no that won if I hadn't taken your advice. I've no idea. It's a you never take my advice about anything else. Disgraceful act of... Tr- well, that's just as well, isn't it, when you look at the way mm. that you're trying to stitch me up, how eh? about How about this from your uh, television-watching experience, oh, right? Yes. Uh, Porky must have been watching Piers on ITV Plus One. <laughs> what a pranit. IT- yeah, have you got ITV Plus One? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you might have been watching that and it was one hour out then. Well, if it was ITV Plus One, yeah. it would have been... The clock would have shown the time an hour before. No, it would have shown an hour later. Eh? ITV plus one, that's one hour. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Uh, no, no, I didn't. I, saw, I, I was watching it on Channel right, 3. So, so if you're watching uh, uh, ITV plus one, yes. right, and it's seven o'clock yes. in, uh, on the show, yes. it's actually what? Six o'clock. Is it? Is that minus one? Minus one, because ITV plus one is an hour later. Yes, it is. You're watching it an hour later mm. at seven o'clock. Well, it starts an hour later. Why would it? I have been watching ITV plus one? I have no idea. Exactly. I don't know why you do anything. There's you know, a lot of reasons. I, well, there's well, lots of things I could ask you about why you do lots of things. When your telly comes up and yeah. you've got like the list of programmes and yeah. all that, it starts, it. it starts at 101 for BBC, mm. then 102 for BBC Two, then yeah. 103 for ITV. Uh huh. The idea that I would suddenly say, oh, I think I'll go another 140 channels down well, and it find might, ITV well, you plus just, you one. have just been there from the night before or something. No, well, I'd be watching ITV one plus one the night before for. So what time was the clock saying? It was saying an hour earlier than it was. Really? Definitely. Are you sure? So, yeah, I'm sure. So I'm what sure. time was it saying? 6.08 when I first switched right. on. Yeah. And it was now, what, 7.08? It was definitely 7.08 because that's what my clock said. And I thought, hang on, has the hour gone back and I've missed it or something like that? Yeah. Mm. But why would they have the clock wrong? I've no idea. It's very strange. I don't know. I, very I, odd. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, that, it, you know, it could be it's ITV plus one, but I can't imagine how I could have got to ITV mm. plus one. Yeah. I better apologise to the TV station <laughs> concern for alleging that they got their clock wrong yeah. if they didn't. Yeah, because but I can't understand why... Fact, funny would... enough, I haven't seen anybody else comment on it except me. No, so it's odd. unlikely to be the case then, isn't it? Mm, yeah, we'll have to see, won't mm. we? Yeah. Right, OK, now then, what we need to talk about are important issues, OK? Yes, very important issues, and yes. And one important issue I want to talk to you about yeah. is the fact that um, I've seen a report over the weekend reading my journals... Yeah. ..the blight of 24-hour drinking laws oh, yeah. is now infesting the country. What now, do you mean? Well, it, it says that, you know, a lot of sort of alcoholic problems have resulted from the introduction of the 24-hour drinking laws, which came in in 1998, apparently, mm. yes. just after the emergence of the first Blair yeah, it government. A, it was the Café Society scenario, wasn't it? Café Society. Now, yeah. 
Is it a good thing or a bad thing, in your opinion? I think uh, the, the, the the old system where you had to go to a pub during particular hours of the day yeah. uh, needed to be sort of brought into the modern world. And I yeah. don't think the advent of 24-hour drinking has actually done anything to change the way that people drink. I think yes. it's just made it more possible for people to kind of stay out later it's, it's, and to start drinking earlier. Right, well, I read in my medical journals, mm. right? Not my social journals, yeah. you know, which talk about human behaviour and all mm. that, but the medical journals. Right. And it says the 24-hour drinking policy has made crime an all-night problem. It's failed to boost... Crime? Uh, yeah, crime, an all-night problem. It's failed to boost um, uh, the economy in any way. Mm. Uh, allowing alcohol to be served round the clock has sucked up police resources... Has it? ..and led to a seismic shift in drinking patterns. Mm. But in sucking up police resources and having so many police concentrate on one factor in life, yeah. i.e. the consequences of drinking much later... And you're talking about the police having to police the centres of towns. And absolutely all that kind of thing, right. Yeah. It's, right. Le- it's led to crimes... But that doesn't really go on every... Not being, not being dealt with in, in other areas of society. Well, I don't think that goes on every single night of the week. I think there's probably a flashpoint on a Friday and a Saturday night. Oh, I'd say Thursday as well. well Thursday's think... payday. Traditionally, people always go out Thursday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and to but some extent not Friday's Sunday. Friday's not payday. Hey, eh? Friday's not payday. Thursday. I mean, most people... Thursday's payday. Well, Thursday, yeah, but I don't think people are getting paid like on a Thursday in cash and then going out you, and spending it. Do you know they're not? But in my day, they were. Well, Thursday I know. In your was, day, they were. Thursday was the biggest night. You used to get this envelope, mm. brown envelope, literally handed yeah. to you. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I've got a bit of a <laughs> throat. <laughs> Well, I thought you were all right now. I am, but the studio's not at uh, equinomicable temperature. Oh, would you like me to put the heater on? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, please, yeah. If you would, please, yeah. yeah. I'll see what I can do. Right, now then. Um, so, you'd get your brown envelope yeah. and have a little and slip in it. how much would you have in it? Uh, £22. Pounds. Right. And have a little slip in it, mm. and it would say, you know, weekly pay, £25. Pounds, deductions. Deductions, mm. tax, and all that. End of £22. Is that all I took out? Three quid? Yeah, apparently, yeah. So now, so, Three pounds? Well, I was very lowly paid. I was a trainee reporter. Yeah. Well, you deserved. So, anyway, we then go to the Diva Hotel, mm. which is on the cross in Chester. How appropriate. Yes, that's right, yeah. And the Victoria next door, right? And what we do is... Yeah, but I'm saying I don't think that goes on anymore. People aren't handed brown envelopes on a Thursday. No, I know. And they go out with their money. No, but what I'm saying is it became a way of life. It mm. has become a way of life for millions of people like me. So Thursday becomes a big night. Mm. Now, also, on a Friday, you used to get half-day Friday... So as long as you could stagger into work for sort of half eight, nine o'clock and mm. get through four hours, which yeah. is always necessary, right. you could be back in the pub by half twelve. Yeah, but also presumably in those days the pub was shut at eleven o'clock anyway, or ten thirty probably on a Thursday night. Yeah, it? but I've explained to you, haven't I, how I could find other places to drink by pledging my political allegiance. Well, like you turn up at the, the old uh, um, the Labour Club well, or somewhere like I that. I remember at the Labour Club once to mm. prove my allegiance. Yeah. I had to stand there and sing, "We'll keep the red flag flying." <laughs> we'll load it. Yeah, we'll, well load just it. to get a drink. Well, just to prove my allegiance. Well, to... how long did they stay open? Oh, well, well, the thing is, they were open all day. Mm. That was the thing. Mm. And then they were open until, I think, 11 o'clock at night. Or yeah, 11:30 but all the pubs were open until, like, 10.30. Yeah, but only 10.30. But, mm. no, but the thing is, it was the lock-in. Yeah. If you were one of the brethren, mm. one of the brethren, yeah. you locked the doors, you stayed there, you know oh. what I mean? That wasn't a problem. OK. But at the same time, at the Tory party club... Yeah. Uh, you had to occasionally sing Land of Hope and Glory for... Um, <laughs> so you did know. you alternate one week from the other? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, for exactly and the, the same reason. And the British Legion, presumably the same? British or Legion. Was the weekend place? I think the British Legion, we used to sing... Uh, what was it? Um, Dam Busters or something. No, no, it was... I think I tell you, there was a bloke there on the piano, and he's about 87 or mm. something, right. and he used to play this... Over here, over there, we'll be here. And the Yanks are coming. Yeah. The Yanks Yanks are coming. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's don't most people's you know, Thursday that. night anymore, I have to say. <laughs> no, no, I have to admit, it's probably not, but that's, mm. what, that's what used to happen. But, um, no, the point of the story is, point of the story is, is that in those days, your drinking habits were curbed mm. by the amount of hours the pubs were open. Exactly. They are not anymore. No. Now, I, mean, I, mean, I remember when I was growing up in, uh, in Hampstead, there was a place that yes. was open, there was a hamburger joint that was open right. until about four in the morning. Right. And so you could go there, but you had to have something to eat, uh, and then you could carry on drinking until about two well, in the morning. Funny you should say that, but when we got to Paddington Station mm. last Friday morning, Gold yes. Cup Day, uh, we went to the hostelry yes. inside. It's a Fuller's Bar, isn't yeah, it's it? It's not a Weatherspoon's, is it? It's not no. Weatherspoon's, it's a no. Fuller's, and I don't know what it's called. Was it called the can't Lion remember. or something? I can't remember. Like that. Called, yeah. Anyway, I walk up to the bar, of course, nine, mm. and our train went at 9 30. 9 36. 9.36, yeah. And I said to the gentleman behind the bar, oh, good morning, how are you? I said, uh, you know, just purely for medical reasons, you know, medical purposes, because mm. I have a pint of um, fullers. Yeah. And he said, yes, sir, but only if you have a sausage sandwich as well. Yeah. Good business, that, isn't it? I said, right, spending okay. more money. Sounds like a good deal. Yeah. So two sausage sandwiches, yeah. and two pints later, we yeah. got onto the train. 
and uh, we're away. Now, yes. I don't know whether it's a right thing. I mean, there are some stations in London where the El Buzo is open at 8 o'clock mm. and serving beer. I saw, did I not see a story over the weekend that one of the fast food joints, and I think at one of the stations, I'm not yeah. sure if it's Victoria, uh, is going to be allowed to sell... Uh, Burger King, uh, They're going think. to be allowed to sell beer. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so, I don't know. It's Waterloo. Is it, I don't know, I don't, yeah. and I don't know from what time it's uh, it's it's going to operate like mm. that. But the the point I am making Mind is you need a beer when you buy a burger at Burger King. They're so expensive. Are they? Yeah, that's a bit yeah. harsh, isn't it? Well, what do you mean a bit harsh? Oh, is it more expensive than McDonald's? Yeah, much more. Yeah, is it? I didn't know that. Yeah. Much more. Anyway, point of my story is: mm. is it a good thing to have? booze accessible to the working man at 8 a.m. in the morning. Well, it's not just to the working man, it's to anyone, isn't it? I, don't, I mean, I don't <laughs> think that's a, I don't think it's one of the great ideas that they've had. I mean, for instance... But I think it's much better that you can drink throughout the course of the afternoon without having to stop at 2 o'clock or yeah, 3 Yeah, I agree with that. And then wait for another two and a half hours to have a drink. I agree. I which think is bonkers. The idea of people hanging around outside pubs in the afternoons. Mm. And, but, I mean, that was for the munitions in the First World War, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, so, yes, what happened was, was that um, people worked in dirty conditions, making mm. bombs and all that kind right. of stuff. So they would go out at about half past 12 right. and lubricate their throats to get rid of the dust, you uh-huh. know, the gunpowder and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, surely you didn't go back to work after that, did they? I was about to say to you, in a two-hour bladder session. Well, and then go back to the munitions factory. Oh, and they started blowing up factories. That doesn't sound very good to and me. And they started blowing each other up. Yeah. This is absolutely true. Mm. I mean, I've studied the um, the history of uh, bomb assembly. Have you? Yes. In... <laughs> so you Why? Think? Well, because I live down in Gosport, oh. and Gosport used to literally... <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. It's a bit, it's a bit throat to a show. Yeah. I think you should probably stop Gosport, talking so much. I no. think that's what's causing your throat to be giving out. No, Gosport used to provide mm. the whole of the British Empire yeah. with all its munitions. Yeah. They were all made in factories there. Really? And, of course, they had to ban people... Mm from drinking excessively in the afternoon because they came back and started blowing everybody up. Yeah, well, it's not very smart, is it? No, it's That's not ridiculous. smart. ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Totally agree. So there's always been a problem with drinking in this country, and I think there always will be. Oh, I'm not that sure about that. That is the way of the world. Mm. Uh, now, coming up, we're going to talk to Ian Bishop. We've got yeah. lots to ask him about. Yeah. Some amazing uh, Premier League results at the weekend. Quite right. Not just Everton gets slaughtered by Arsenal, of course. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> Talk sport, we are the two mics, winners and losers coming up a little bit later on in the show. We're going to talk to a wit coming up in the next hour as well, since it's International Week. Thought yes. we'd get a bit of an international flavour going. Idea. Uh, but there's loads and loads of football to talk about from the weekend, of course. Let's talk to Ian Bishop, uh, a man uh, who I've been told off for saying uh, former Everton player, because of course he played for West Ham as well. Simon in London. Oh, so it's real he, love, I think. He played over Everton. 250 times for mm. West Ham. Why yes. calling him an Everton footballer? Yes. Ian, a very good morning to you. How are you doing, fellas? You okay? You very know, well, you, you, know, you. you don't mind being referred to as a former Everton player, do you? No, I don't, mate. Look, that's that's where I uh, that's where I kicked my career off, mate. That's where I got me grounded. Absolutely. Uh, and it was a pretty well, miserable yeah, weekend if you're an Everton fan as well. Once again, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, bit of an anticlimax and it comes down after the the win against Chelsea. You know, it was, but, uh, yeah. You know. Well, you say you know him, but I mean, we really don't know now, do we? The point is, the new owner um, was in the stand. He's watching it. <clears throat> if he's going to put a lot of money into a football club, he'll be really researching the possibility of how much success he's going to bring him. And uh, I think he'll have a view on all this over the summer, particularly as reading headlines tonight in saying Ro- uh, Romelu Lukaku is a target for Real Madrid for £60 million. Um, I, wow. I, know, I, I know that somebody like Mr Kenwright would never uh, vouchsafe uh, a consideration for one of his players, but who knows what the, the new ownership might think about. You know, they bought it for 28 and if an offer for 60 comes in, who knows what might happen. No, you never know, do you? I mean, you'd like to think now that with the money coming in that, that they'd be able to entice him to stay. Yeah. Um, the same would, same would be of John Stones, which seems like, you know, um, it looks like Guardiola's going to make a move for him as well. You know, it, when you do bring these good players through, though, um, they're always going to be targets for the bigger boys anyway. Well, they are, but the only thing I would say is that um, John Stones has still got many, many years to go. Lukaku makes the point that I've been a professional footballer now for seven years and I haven't played in the Champions League. And, of course, he spent three of those seasons, didn't he, sort of being put out on loan by Chelsea and playing in the reserves and all that kind of stuff. I think the boy's just desperate to play at the highest level because he's a very good player, and I suppose any ex-professional footballer like yourself can understand that. Well, I think for any player right now, once you're there, Real Madrid come calling, 
um, it, it does prick your ears a little bit, doesn't it? So you, you can understand why, if if that does occur, that he would be prepared to go. Yeah. But he seems now like you know he's hit a bit of form, and he's I, I thought he'd found a home. But it's never the case anymore in football, fellas, is it? No, it really isn't. And I mean, uh, I think mm. what Mike was alluding to there as well was is, is Roberto Martinez going to be the guy that they think can do it for them? Because I mean, they'd expect to be challenging for for top four. And you see West Ham would, doing yeah. it. Uh, you see uh, Leicester up there as Indeed. well. You know, Everton's still down there in sort of uh, you know the bottom half of the division. They I need know. to they need to improve somewhat, don't they? They do definitely. But um, what what big names are going to be floating around there right now? You know. Mm. Um, you know, if if the thing with Mourinho goes ahead at Man U, Louis van Gaal's going to be available. Is that somebody that that they're going to look at? I I, I very much doubt that. One of the big names are going to be about. Mm. That would be amazing, wouldn't it, Mike? If uh, Louis van Gaal came to Everton. Uh, I, can't I can't see that happening in a million happening. years. Although, let's talk about Van Hal, because, I mean, what, mm. what about that performance at the weekend? Where Manchester, what's going on, going on with Manchester City? And United actually managed to uh, get the three points from him. Um, well, I mean, I've seen it coming all the way back when they played Liverpool at home. And I think I said at the time that, oh, it's just a blip. But it hasn't turned into that, has it? Mm. It's, uh, I've been proved wrong. I think I think to rely on the... the the one man like they do mainly with Vincent Company, and as soon as he's not there, I don't think Mangala's filled the hole. I don't think Otamendi's filled the hole, and definitely not Di Michele, has he? Mm. So, um, you know, now now they've got more injuries to to cope with. They've looked a bit flat to me, to tell you the truth. Mm. And if David Silva's not firing. And then they lose a bit of that edge, don't they? Yeah, well, I think they've looked a bit flat mm. ever since it was announced that Pellegrini was leaving and Pep Guardiola was coming in. A lot of people said that wouldn't matter, but I think it's made a huge difference to him somehow. I think that was the last time we spoke, wasn't yeah, it? We, I think we, so. we talked about the effect it has in the dressing room. Mm. You know, there's going to be some players who think, well, I'm a fighting for a place next season, or I'm a definitely going to be on my way out, you know? And, mm. you know, you're looking for Yaya to step up, and he doesn't. He seems to do it when he feels like. I've said it before, I don't honestly think Sterling has been the player that, that they signed or they thought they were getting. Um, you know, Nasri's been out for a while. They've had, they've had injury problems, like I say, with company. Now mm. Joe Hart's struggling a little bit. You know, it, it doesn't look too good, does it? No, no it doesn't. And do you think there's a real changing of the guard coming about in football? Because Leicester have proved now that by getting a very good manager, an organised team, and a sprinkling of good players through your team, you can do it. And that's why... Old MG here, he alluded to the Everton situation. Three key players, John Stones, Ross Barkley, Lukaku, should have been good enough for Everton to be at least challenging for a top four place. West Ham are going to burst into that um, that uh, top four scenario. Tottenham are definitely in it. Leicester might even win it. I mean, this is a change in the guard in a big way. And maybe it's because there's so much for, uh, money around now that just buying good players... You know, I've heard people say, Arsene Wenger's got to go out and start spending again. Well, Leicester didn't spend. It might be all about how good the manager is in future rather than how big his checkbook is. Well, well I also, without sounding like an old fossil, mate, um, I also think that, you know, they don't change their starting line-up too often, do they? Belgium, Leicester, no. Uh, Leicester, no, no. No, they, they, they sort of haven't had the big bucks to spend, but they've kept that consistency because they've got 11 players who's throughout the season got used to playing it together. And, you know, when you look at it now, it's frightening, mate, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I thought a while back, the bubble's going to burst. The bubble's going to burst. They keep sneaking these 1-0 wins. And I, I even said, and people have said it on the TV, they'll struggle against teams, which they probably do, because they seem better when they're on the counter-attack, when, when other teams have more possession than them. But they still nick the wins. I know, I know, I think it was a draw against West Brom, but one before that was a last-minute win against Norwich. But mm. then they've gone to Palace and gone and done it as well, and that's not an easy place, is it? No, indeed. And, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, the, 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 mm. how they've stretched it all. I mean, so they're five points ahead uh, of uh, Spurs. They're near 11 points ahead of Arsenal. <laughs> uh, you know, 40, 15 points ahead of Manchester City. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible kind of run that they've been on. You can't see... I, I just can't see them not winning it now. Well, you know, you know, it, it, it would be really refreshing, wouldn't it? Mm. I think um, for that to happen, the, the, the chasing pack have not been up to scratch, have they? I mean, it, it started off with Chelsea early doors falling out the running way, way early, and then, like you say, it, it looks like the title that nobody wanted. Mm. They mm. just kept grinding away, and they've got themselves a little cushion now, haven't they? They can afford a couple of little slip-ups and, and still be and still be out there. I think it's amazing that they've made the Champions League this season, but you know, I mean. You know, you keep hearing Aaron Ranieri saying, you know, you're not even thinking about the title or whatever. Mm. And, and they're, doing it, they're doing it exactly like that. 
And then, and then it would be an amazing uh, year for West Ham as well, would it not, if they managed to win the FA Cup and get into the top four? Mm. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm sure they look at it as just, you know, if they did win one trophy and, and not get in the top four or get in the top four and maybe not win the FA Cup, still going to be a fantastic season for them. Um, for me, I'm on my way back um, on Thursday. I'm going to play Mark Noble's testimonial. Oh, um, next, next week on Eastern Monday, yeah, I'm going to get these old bones out there, mate. So, Excellent. Uh, the yeah. whole thing about the last season at Upton Park, and let's hope there's some success to go with it. You know, it'll be really fitting for the club, mate. Yeah, do you think Mark Noble should have been in the England squad? Definitely. Yeah. At some yeah. stage, I think this has been one of his better seasons as well. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, it's baffled me. It's baffled me, mate, a little bit. Yeah, everybody talks about him very highly this season, indeed. They do. Ian, yeah. well, listen, maybe we'll see you when you're over in this part of the uh, of the world. Thanks indeed. very much indeed for talking to us. Ian Bishop there, uh, former Manchester City Everton and West Ham midfielder, of course, uh, looking back on some of the stuff at the weekend. Some extraordinary games at the weekend as well, which we'll have to yeah. talk about coming up uh, in the next hour or so. We've got winners and losers as well. Mm. Uh, we're talking to a witch... Uh, coming up, I want you to be uh, very careful what you say to her in case she casts some kind of spell on you. Which Cast might a not be spell on you. On, uh, a very good idea for you. You can tweet us at the two mics. You can tweet Mr. Parry at Mike Parry 8 and uh, of course uh, at IROMG is where you'll find me. Uh, here's one from the Reverend Davey in Canterbury. Oh, yes. He says, Mr. Parry is correct regarding one hour difference on ITV. Uh, the same thing happened with myself and it was very confusing. And he says, also, the Judas theory is spot on, Mr. Parry. Thank you very much indeed. Is that so, from a reverend? Well, he says he's the Reverend Davy in uh, oh, yeah. Canterbury, but I'm yeah. not sure if he's actually well, a reverend. Canterbury's a pretty um, ecclesiastical town. Well, you think everybody there's a reverend? Well, I don't think everybody there's a reverend, right. but if, it, if but, you're so Just be a... because he's put reverend in front of yeah. his name, you yeah. think he's a, a credible figure? Uh, well, not many people go around calling themselves reverend, doctor, judge, if they're not. Really? Unless they're a bit of a nutter. Well, I mean, and we uh, don't have many uh, listeners who are nutters. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily the case. But, well, I, I mean, since he's, he's the only person that said he spotted it as well, I think I think you're very confused. So, so no, hang on. So, are you saying that um, that tweet has given my theory credibility? I'm not sure if it has. Or are you saying that the Reverend from Canterbury might have been watching ITV Plus One as well? He might have been. I yeah. can't, I can't yeah. explain it. Yeah. It's well, one of those strange I, I things, isn't it? it? Anyway, there we go. Uh, Steve says, uh, "Can uh, the witch put a spell on Porky to shut him up? She can't perform miracles, I put bet." Put a spell on me. And who's, William, who, whose hit record was that? Put a spell on me. Put a spell on me. Mm. John will find it for us. I'm not. It's not put a name a... that I would know. I'm sure. It's a, it's a woman singer, you know, with a great voice. Put a spell I think there's a couple me. of songs you're okay. thinking of. OK, anyway, please go on. I'm sure people will let us know. Yes. Uh, here's William. He says, I said seven weeks ago, and I stand by it, Manchester City had better get used to playing Thursday night football. Right. Well, you know, he could well be right there. Thursday night football, that's become an acronym, hasn't it, for failure. Did you notice, really by the has, way, that uh, I celebrated the 10th anniversary of Twitter by sending out your Raheem Sterling tweet? Uh, did you? Yeah. Oh, that was very helpful. You didn't know that? That was very helpful. What have you been helpful. doing all day? By the way... What can, have you been doing all can day, I just anyway? say? Can I just say in the Raheem mm. Sterling thing? Yes. OK, technically, I'm slightly wrong in saying he wouldn't score more slightly than five wrong. Premier League goals this, this is season. This is a red-letter day. Five Premier League goals For you to this admit season. even being slightly wrong is a right. major, major step so forward. So he goes off with an injury mm. in the failed game against Manchester United Correct. on Sunday. Yes. It's now unlikely he'll play for another month. Mm. Which means it's unlikely you'll score any more goals this season. So let's You're face... not going to make another prediction. No, no, let's face it. My, my attitude towards the Raheem Sterling £58 million transfer mm. is much, much closer to being accurate and right than to being in any way wrong, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. No, it because is. you said he wouldn't score five goals, i.e. he would score less than five, and he scored more than five, so it's entirely wrong, 100% wrong. It's not because Completely he's... Completely and utterly wrong. I think I should be given great... Credence here for the fact that it actually Credence. he's only scored in four Premier League games. How about credit? He's only scored in four Premier League games. You didn't say how many he games. He scored a hat trick in, in one game against a lowly opposition and he scored three other goals. Which lowly opposition? Lowly. How lowly? Lowly. Lowly? Lowly. Lowly as a cloud. Lowly how lowly as a cloud. I wonder I learned I wonder hang on. <laughs> I, I know this poem very, very well. Dear. It's called uh, Daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud mm. that floats on high o'er vale and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of dancing daffodils, along the lake, within the breeze, Is they it fluttered gaily. No, or sorry, along the lake, beneath the trees, they fluttered gaily in the breeze. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? And what I about know. the rest of it? What? That's not all. Of it, oh, is I only it? gave you the first six lines. Well, what about the rest of it? You don't need the. You don't need the rest of it. 
What, uh, what you say? It's just the greatest hit still of poetry front. Have you not seen the time? I have I've seen got, the time. I've got time to give you the rest of it, have I? Uh, no, you, you probably idiot. haven't. You probably haven't. But you have got time to put together some decent winners and losers, which I hope you've done. Oh, I have. Don't really? worry about that. You're going to get smashocated tonight. You uh, really are. I'm not uh, I'm not worried about it. As, mm. as ever, I will issue the normal kind of plea to keep it clean and yeah. to not ask people to vote porky and vote often yeah. uh, or indeed to gerrymander any sort of result as okay. best you can. Uh, now, we've got this uh, woman coming up called Courtney Webber, uh, who's a witch and priest in the next hour. So I want you to treat her with uh, uh, the respect that she deserves. Enticing name, Courtney. Courtney, yeah, mm. indeed. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on, of course. Lots of offerings on who sang I, I Put a Spell on You. Uh, yeah. The best known version, according to Mac, is by Nina Simone. Nina uh, who Simone. talked about many times. Yeah. Uh, Geordie says this. Uh, Geordie Bry, rather. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, Can you tell Porky the song's called Put a Spell on You? And it's by Screaming Jay Hawkins. There's nah. also another one called The Same by Annie Lennox. Uh, Annie Lennox, yeah. now a terrific singer, Annie Lennox. Here the comes the rain yeah, you don't again. You have to start singing her, her songs now. Falling on the earth like lovers do. No, I don't think that's yeah, quite yeah. the right words. Well, and and know, also, like Connell that. says uh, the song yeah. is I Put a Spell on You and it's sung by Bette Midler in the movie Hocus Pocus. I haven't seen that. No, it's not. Not have seen Hocus Pocus? I, uh, no, I, I've heard of Hocus Pocus by Focus. That yeah. was the uh, the uh, Scandinavian group. Mm. But they I were know, Dutch, weren't they? I know. Oh, Dutch were they? Okay, they were yeah. Dutch. I tell you that uh, every time yeah, you tell me they yeah, were Scandinavian. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But I know nothing about uh, that record. Mm. Uh, now then, now then. Now, now do you know then. about the uh, the house? I finished the House of Cards this weekend. Oh, you did? Yeah. Right. Have you started watching it yet? No, I haven't, because, of course, I had to see and watch mm. the latest episode of The Night Manager. Yeah, The Night Manager. Yeah. So I've, the, I've, pen, I've... the penultimate episode. Yeah, penultimate. I'll have some views on that tomorrow night Will in you? Porky Vision. Oh, you don't want to talk about it tonight. Jude, the word Judas came up in that as well. Yes, it did. Extraordinary. Yes. But mm. I'll have some views on that tomorrow night. I'll also have views on... Have I talked about the end of Happy Valley? I think I haven't. Yeah, I... you did, yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah? I don't think I'd seen... Oh, did I? I can't remember. No, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was one hour ahead as well. Yes, it, well, I, I think it was one hour ahead. Now, listen. That's finished now, isn't it? <clears throat> what? Happy Valley. Happy Valley's finished. Yeah. And uh, over the weekend. I think Sarah, you did give, I think you gave the end away. I, oh, did I? I did, yeah, probably. Mm. Sarah Lancashire says she's not sure she's going to make another one. Really? Because she thinks it's uh, it's run its course. Mm. But I think millions well, how of many, fans. How many series have they done now? Two. Is that all? Yeah, but there were only six episodes mm. in the second one. And I think there were more in the first one. I mm. could have sworn the first one was eight or something. No, I don't know. I haven't seen any <laughs> of them. Excuse me. Anyway, now listen. Mm. We talked about the British Empire, did we not, in when? the last hour? Hey, In the last hour. The British Empire? Yes. When? I said to you, mm. the reason we have uh, licensing laws in this country yeah. is because Gosport, where yeah. I live... Well, you talked about the munitions factories, yeah. Funded the munitions all around the world. about the British Empire. Well, it was the British Empire. We had an empire, and I said the munitions for the whole of the empire mm. were put together okay. in Gosport and shipped well, out. I didn't think it was a conversation about the British Empire, but by anyway, the Royal on. By the Royal Navy, mm. when, when Britain ruled the waves... Oh, there's the Arsenal goals being shown again. Well, I think you just missed them. What do you mean? That's that's Spurs. Now it is now, yeah. But Spurs just before, that, just before that, it was yeah. Arsenal. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about mm. was this: for hundreds of years, yeah. we have had to um, face the condemnation of the world for having an empire, right? Yes. Called imperialist, called uh, what else have been called? Imperialists and uh, what else? Are they Racists. Called? Uh, sometimes, mm. but people who go around... Um, colonialists. Colonialists, that's the word I was yeah. looking for, right? Now then, <clears throat> would you believe somebody sent me a book? I wouldn't believe that, no. And this book is called The Making of India, The Untold Story of British Enterprise. Mm. And it's written by an Indian gentleman, uh-huh. a, an Indian scholar, right. called Carter Lal Varney. OK. OK? Right. He says the best thing that ever happened to India was the British arriving there. Mm. They didn't invade it, didn't take it over... They didn't colo- uh, uh, colonise Colonize it. it. They actually made it a trading partner. Mm. And as a result, both countries benefited. But he, he, he says that, you know, amazing things happened. Not only did the British give India a legal system, an efficient police force, and a political army, and a smooth-running, if astonishingly bureaucratic, civil service, mm. but the concrete benefits, with concrete written in inverted commas, they provided. Let's start with the roads. When the British arrived, there were no roads. In 1836, work began to construct a highway between Calcutta and Lahore, a distance of 1,423 miles. Mm. No road had ever been built longer than two or 300 miles anywhere in the world at the time. Yeah. And the Romans were the last people to have embarked on such... Um, they did build some great roads. Yeah, such long-term uh, tracks, mm. OK? Yes. When it was finally completed, 30 years later... 
wheeled carriages could roll across the land for the first time. Right. It was the first time that we were able to put proper, mm. you know, uh, metal wheels and then yeah. rubber wheels onto roads. Rubber wheels? Yeah. What do you mean, tyres? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Not only that, trees had been planted every 60 feet along the way to provide beautification and much-needed shade to travellers mm. because the British realised how hot it was. Mm. Then, of course, there were the railways. In a section entitled Awe-Inspiring Railway Statistics, Lalvani lists how India's railways came to cover the map. The statistics are awe-inspiring. In 1853, there were 21 miles of railway in India. Ten years later, when the British took it over, there were 2,512 miles of railway. And 20 years after that, there were over 10,000 miles of railway. Mm. In the 20 years after that, there were 26,000 miles of railway, about what it is today. The British built more railways in India than America, France, Germany and other European so colonies. So they didn't build more railways here, then? It is, really, yeah. They built sort of in shut the, them down. Yeah, built in their colonies. Mm. And in order to do so, they had to build bridges. Lots and lots of bridges, because there were lots of ravines and, and rivers to get over. Yeah. Um, so it's worth recalling Franklin D. Roosevelt's quote, there can be little doubt that in many ways the story of bridge building is the story of civilization. And that's a true quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt. What he meant was, if you can't go over a river, mm. if you can't go over the next ravine, yeah. if you can't traverse a mountain, mm. then your, your, your horizons are so limited. I suppose in those days that was the only way to get there as well, because, of course, now you can fly. Yeah. So you don't need yeah. a bridge, do you? No, exactly, exactly. Um, and by bridge building, you can measure people's progress. The British had been building bridges in India long before the railways came along. In 1811, the first iron bridge in British India was built across the Gomti River at Lucknow. Uh, the design was based on a bridge over the River Weir in Sunderland. Uh -huh. But get this, this is absolutely incredible. Is it? And we're talking now about 1811, OK? Right. When the bridge was shipped to India, it was the largest single structure ever exported from Britain and rebuilt in a country in the history of the world. Mm. It consisted of 2,627 separate pieces of girder metal and, on arrival, only 19 bolts had been broken. To build the similar railway that led from the plains up to the cooler hill country, the track had to climb almost 500 feet, requiring the construction... Get this, this is incredible... ..of 103 tunnels... And the railway was only 60 miles long. 103 tunnels? 103 tunnels. In 60 miles? Yes. Shouldn't they have chosen a more efficient route, then? Well, they couldn't, because they had to go round the mountain like that. Mm. Yeah, almost like one of those Christmas decorations mm. where the train goes round and up and down, you know what I mean? No. Um, the, the other thing they built was a, um, a mint. They built... Because uh, India didn't have any sort of currency, mm. the British built... Well, they didn't have rupees. They must have had repeats. It, there was more bartering than, than currency mm. when the British arrived. So in the late 1700s, the British decided to construct a mint in Calcutta. Behind a colonnaded facade inspired by the Temple of Minerva in Athens, steam-driven machines stamped out 200,000 coins every eight hours to give India the first proper but and regulated about, But what about all the currency? great sort of, uh, architecture that was in existence in India before the British ever got there? There like wasn't the a lot Rahal there. And all that. There wasn't a lot there. But all the Maharajas were travelling across, you know, land, going into Persia, yeah, sure. going, going across the world in ships and all the rest of a it. Absolutely, and they built some magnificent buildings, they you did. know, which stand to this day. Yeah. But they were only the preserve of the very, very wealthy. They mm. weren't for the benefit of the Indian community. A few years after they built the first mint, another equally grand mint in Bombay was constructed. When an Indian engineer at the Bombay Mint came to London in the 1840s, he took one look at the Royal Mint and said, why is your building so much inferior to ours? Mm. Because the mint that we built in India was four times the size of the Royal Mint in Britain. Right. I mean, it no, isn't... more space it, over there. It is an incredible um, story, honestly. It's really worth reading. I, I went through the book over the weekend. Yeah. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So what's his conclusion, though? Because obviously all that stuff is a very, very long time the, ago. The conclusion is is that... I mean, that's all very well about talking about the you yeah. know, building the kind of infrastructure sure, of the country. Sure, sure. But India would not be India today on the brink of an economic boom mm. if it didn't have the infrastructure the British gave to it. No, I'm sure that's and true. It's, and it's taken India about 60 years. I think we handed it back in 48, didn't we? 40, well, the partition video was 47. 47, yeah, yeah, that's right, 47, 48. 48, Pakistan was founded, I think. And uh, so it's about 65 years. It's taken the Indians um, that long to um, self... What's the word? They've I'm got a space program. You've got a space program. Yeah. Uh, uh, to self, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Self, uh, self what? establish, self establish, or whatever, something like that, mm. right? And uh, and and produce a modern country. 
um, other things that we didn't realise is um, when you're waiting for the kettle to boil for your tea, we've just had some tea delivered into the studio mm. here, OK? Reflect on the fact that the British first took the tea mm. uh, to India and set up all the first um, tea plantations, right? Well, where did they bring the tea from? Well, I, I can't actually f- find that. I was trying to find that mm. out. I, I don't know. But but um, in the space of ten years... Because I thought tea was in Sri Lanka. I thought that was where the tea that's grew. That's what I thought. Mm. But it says in ten years, uh, Brit- Britain turned India into the biggest tea producer in the world, and it has been mm. ever since. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Right. Well, they may, I suppose they may have mechanised it or done something to it. But, you yeah. know, tea, well, tea was discovered in China, I think, first, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it probably was. But the British we, didn't bring it from there. Well, we might have done, because we fought a lot of opium wars in China, yeah. smashing up the Chinese to get to... Uh, to, um, I don't know why we smashed up the Chinese, actually. Probably, was it to get rid of opium? Or uh, did probably. we want to buy the opium? I well, can't I remember. I think it was to technically get rid of it. Certainly get rid of the opium, yeah. And we used to send a load of gunboats up the Yangtze, didn't we? Mm. And uh, blow we up did. a few places there. Yeah, we did. Which wasn't very nice or very good. But maybe maybe we took a few uh, tea plants and took it to India. But, look, you know, it is a fantastic book. And uh, India's a magnificent country. I've never actually been there. I've been oh, to I Pakistan. Been there. No, I've been to Pakistan. Oh, right. uh, I've been to India. But I, this has really whetted my appetite to go. Really? Because it says there's so many great things about go. the country. I think yeah. you should go, yeah. but you wouldn't like it. It's very hot there. Yeah, yeah, OK. It's very hot, but, I mean, I've been to other hot places. I've been to Qatar mm. when it was 51 degrees. You know, I can cope with these things. You know you, that? Well, why do you keep complaining about it when it gets about 70 degrees here in Fahrenheit, then? Because only one-third of my heart works, no, yeah, and right. therefore it's bound to affect that old, me. That old okay? chestnut. Huh? That old chestnut. Hey? This is Talk Sport. UEFA Champions League football live on Talk Sport. Get set for another season of exhilarating European football action. Come on! Featuring full match commentaries of all the Premier League teams in action and updates and goal flashes as they hit the back of the net. Champions of Europe again. Plus full on post match phone ins following all the action. UEFA Champions League football live on Talk Sport with Direct Line. For five star rated van insurance, search Direct Line Van. The family member who was concerned. <laughs> The neighbour who felt uneasy. The teacher who was worried. The coach who noticed at practice. And you. Together, we can tackle child abuse. If you suspect child abuse, visit gov.uk forward slash report child abuse to find out who to call. If you've recently noticed that you're starting to lose your hair, there are a range of options open to you. You could have a hair transplant, as long as you're earning as much as a Premier League footballer. For the more thrifty amongst us, there's always the classic comb-over. Or if you really want to make a statement, why not go all out and get yourself a poodle perm wig? (coughs) However, if you want to do something effective, you're going to need facts, not fiction. Regain for Men Extra Strength Scalp Foam contains minoxidil, which has been scientifically proven to help stop and even reverse hereditary hair loss, working deep down at the root. It can be used on a receding hairline, and the earlier you start using it, the higher your chances of success. You can even start seeing visible results in 16 weeks. And now Regain has an app that gives you support and advice to track your progress and maintain your twice-daily routine. Separate the facts from the fiction at regain.co.uk. Regain contains minoxidil. At the, as at the Coco Witch, uh, she's a witch, she's going to be telling us all about witchcraft and, and why it's become so Coco's popular. Coco's the star. Now, now, here's one from Kevin. He says, I right. think that was Porky's first interesting story. Bravo, hashtag man of the east. What's that? Uh, well, the one you've just about told. India? Yeah. Ah, that's uh, but not everybody agrees. A hackman yeah. says, uh, well, Porky didn't know I was listening to the History Channel. No. Hashtag I'm falling asleep. Oh no! Don't fall asleep. Mm. Be fascinated by the you know the the way the world has developed mm. over the years. It, I nearly it, uh, I nearly worked in India. You know, uh, in what in what I way? I was offered a job editing a magazine when I was there. Oh really? Yeah, English speaking magazine. Yeah, obviously. of course. Yeah. Well, well the, the Times of India so... is still one of the world's most respectable mm. papers. You know that. Well, do it you? is. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I was working at the time for for an India magazine based here in London. Oh, I, I went see. out there for about a month. Well, oh, and, you went uh, out to India? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Whereabouts? Yeah, I was in Delhi. Uh, for oh, most I didn't of know it. that. I thought you'd never been there. No, of course I've told you about this before, no, but you've never bothered that. listening. Oh, right, OK. And uh, I went mm. to Agra, went to see the Taj Mahal. Yes. I uh, went to see um, Jaipur. Jaipur, yeah. yeah. Which was where the Maharaja had this great big palace, right? And it was an amazing place because yes. they had 
Uh, they basically were the first mm. people to introduce air conditioning mm. to the world. Yes. Because they worked out that if you actually, you know, refracted the air, yeah. it yeah. would kill it down. Yeah. And if you ran water behind where you refracted oh, the air... Oh, that's right. Air conditioning actually, yeah. for the first time. Yeah, they did. Yes. So they yes. did that long before the British ever got there. Oh. Um, and and the, the travelling that, that some of these Maharajas did was quite incredible. Yes. But I was, I was at a party... Well, like with the elephant um, convoys well, 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 and all yeah, that I went over to Persia and all that. Yeah. But when I was uh, mm. at some party, because there's a lot of parties being thrown yeah. I was there for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, actually, uh, which was around about, I don't know, 1982 or something Where like was that, that. In New Delhi. And how did you cope with the heat? Um, well, I don't mind the heat. What? I don't mind the heat. Plus, it was, in, it, it was not in their summer. Oh, I see. It was, you know, so it was probably about sort of 30 degrees. It wasn't ridiculously hot. I didn't know they had a summer and a winter. Yeah, they do. It's you not... never hear about a winter in India, do you? Well, what do you think the Himalayas get covered in snow during? Yeah, but that's in the Himalayas. Mm. I mean, you, you don't get, uh, you know, places like uh, yeah, Calcutta. But they, a, but they have a hot season and, and a cold uh, season. Mumbai, mm. they, do, they don't have cold weather. Well, they don't have very cold weather, but the point is, is that they do have, you know, seasons, though. That's yes, the point. Yes. Anyway, this guy came up to me and said he wanted me to... Uh, he was very impressed. I was only about 22 or something. Yeah, time, 21, sure, 22. Yeah, yeah. And he said, I'd love Conduate you to be able to... some uh, sort of bum job. He yeah. said, I'd, I'd love you to edit one of my magazines Ooh. that he was going to launch. And yeah. I nearly did, actually. But the reason I didn't was because I wanted to get to, to America and I wanted to go to New York. So. Yes. But in my life, could have been completely different if I'd stayed there. Yeah, of course it could. Because there were a lot of reasons to stay there. It was a great place. Now, uh, could now be a big shot in uh, Bollywood or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, exactly. You, you might have gravitated over there. I might have done. And I'd never yeah. have met you, of course, either. Never met me. That so my life a, could have been completely different. Been a bonus. Now, listen, can I tell you about my terracotta pot? Yes, you can. Right. Is that on your terracotta um, well, garden, uh, garden on the roof? Well, the problem is I haven't got it. Now, this is a great... I'm, I'm really upset, right? Upset why? I'm going to show you this. Look, mm. what does that say? That says free mega terracotta pot. Yes. Plant pot. Yes. Free. Where from? Well, I have a newspaper. No, Pick no. Pick up this weekend from B&Q. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we have to take this thing with you, presumably. Yes, yes. So I cut it out, right, and... Uh, Why I'm do you want a giant terracotta pot? Oh, because it's free. I get it free in my newspaper. So I thought <laughs> I thought it would be brilliant. Right. So, anyway... So did you go down there? No. I didn't have time. This mm. is the problem. By the right. time I got there, they closed. I see. And I didn't get my terracotta pot, but mm. I'm really upset because look at the size of it. Isn't it brilliant? Well, you don't really know how big it is because oh, that woman do. could be very small. No, but there's a lady there, and it's a, I, I would say that's a two-foot-high pot. Would you not? No. What? No, I would say that she's inches? quite a small woman. All right, 18 probably, inches. It might be 18 inches, yeah. But it's a big, that's a big pot, that. Well, what would now, you put in it? Well, it's fantastic because, funny enough, in the week after Easter... Mm. Um, believe it's Easter already, by the way. Eh? It's Easter this weekend, Easter, isn't it? It's Easter next weekend. The week after Easter, my uh, housekeeper mm. is bringing in the gardeners to um, rebuild, you the know... The gardeners? Yeah, the spring... The, spring, uh, the gardeners? The gardeners well, coming in to do the garden. about 10 foot by 2 foot. No, 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 my roof garden. Is quite extensive. No, it's not. You've We've only seen... ever seen it from no, one I've angle seen, on I've a picture. I've seen pictures of it. I've also yeah, been ridiculous. there and looked at it. No, ridiculous. It's anyway, tiny. Anyway, the well, point how many is... gardeners do you need for that? Uh, two. And her. She she does all the... So three people to yeah, look she after does all the space. No, about well, the size... No, well, no. Of, about a quarter of the size of the studio. No, no, it's not. Not to look after it, but to set it up for the summer. You mm. see what I mean? For right. the spring and the summer, plant all the bulbs, all that kind of stuff. Now, Why? Why'd you bother? Well, because it looks, sees it. it looks beautiful. Yeah, but nobody ever sees it, though. I see it. I see it. I wake up in the morning, look out the window, and I think it's a thing of beauty. Mm. Now, what I was going to say is, she will buy some terracotta pots like this. In fact, if you get a terracotta pot that big, mm. you won't be able to move out there. I mean, oh, you know, you'd, have to, you'd have to take all the furniture out. Could have half a dozen of those, and no. there's plenty of spare room. No, no. And I got, I was so upset because it came to the end of the weekend, and I thought, I know I forgot to do something. Ah! Then I realised I should have gone and got me a terracotta mm. plant pot, and it was, they were closed. Yeah, well, you won't get it now, because an awful lot... I mean, there's been rows about can... some of these newspaper offers in the past, yeah. because uh, basically, if, if you don't get there within about the first hour in the morning, they're all gone. You could only um, you could only go and get it Saturday and Sunday, yeah. and, I, and, I, and Saturday I was away, because we'd been away Friday, yeah. I had to go and sort everything out on Saturday, sort everything down out. on the coast. What do you uh, mean? Well, yeah, so what paper. else? I saw everything. Well, paperwork, that sort of thing. Well, some of that, yeah. yeah. Somebody sent me a tweet actually of, a, of me in a, a library saying he's looking after your paperwork. It was r- rather cruel. I tell you, well, else that's I... because you spent seventeen hours going to you doing no. paperwork. I tell you, what else I did rediscover over the weekend because mm. I needed a bit of a sugar infusion. Huh? Sugar infusion. Angel delight. Angel delight. Well, you bought some Angel Delight. Yeah, but you guess why I bought it? I've no idea. I, disco- I, I found for the first time in years, because mm. literally I've been looking for it for years, yeah. butterscotch flavour, see? See on the bottom it says mm. butterscotch? So what do you do with that? There's, there's you sa- put milk in it. sachet. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what, you pour it into what, a bowl? You put it into a... Uh, I've a never pot- had Angel Delight. Oh, it's beautiful. So tell us how you make it. Well, what you do is you cut the top off this sachet, Yeah. right? And it's, it's a good quality sachet. Feel it. Good quality paper. Good quality sachet. Yeah, yeah. You know, like well, it's, nice it's, metal it's paper. It's plastic, isn't it? 
Well, there's uh, still powder coming out of it, is there? No, no well, there's still powder coming no, out of it. No, there isn't. There is. No, there isn't. No, I washed it out. Um, you washed it out. Yes, I did. Yes, uh, it's it's metal and uh, plastic, I suppose. Yeah, and um, I don't think there's any metal in it. Yeah, there is, like foil. You know what I mean, foil. Mm. And um, and then you tip it into a Pyrex bowl, and then you put a half pint of milk in it. Yeah, and then you get your whisk out. Right. Shh. Have you got electric whisk? No. Got a hand whisk. You've got one of those hand, hand whisk. Hand whisk, yeah. 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 And how well, you... I have got an electric whisk, actually, mm. but I never bring it out because it's too complicated to stick the old whisk. You don't know uh, how to use it, do you? I do know how to use no, it. You don't. I do. I do. Uh, one time I used it without pushing the old whisk in properly and it mm. came off. Right. It made a hell of a mess. Yeah, I bet it did. It really did. So, yeah. how long do you have to whisk it for? Oh, not long. Ten minutes? No. Five? Three, four minutes. And what happens? Does it get all fluffy? Yeah, and then you stick it in the fridge for five minutes. Right. And, and what's the consistency? It's beautiful. Then? It's it's the consistency of sort of... Is it like, um, like a mousse that you used to buy? Yes, that's right. I was going to say, not really? ice cream, but mousse, yeah. Mm. But isn't that meant for more than one person? Oh, that I don't think all of it sachet. at once. I'll leave a bit in, have it later. Well, how long can you keep it for? Well, you can keep it forever. You know, it's, it's that forever. sort of stuff. But anyway, look, that was just a discovery I made when I was out shopping this weekend, OK? Just so I'd let you know. No, thank you very much. Now, um, what are we going to talk about? Sorry, you were going to mention something then. What was it? Well, I can read you this from Sue in Tunbridge. Oh, that'd be good. Um, I think uh, he's got short man syndrome and an early form of dementia. Please remind him that it's only one third of his brain that works. What? Uh, I think this is uh, Sue in Tunbridge's uh, way of telling you that you may not have been uh, entirely firing at all cylinders. Did you get enough sleep at the weekend? Yes. Are you sure? Plenty, yes. Yes. Right. yes. After we'd... Um, well, we went to Cheltenham didn't we, with hardly any sleep the night before, which yeah, well, was great. Yeah, ba- barely any at all. And then a long day, and then uh, Saturday, a bit of a recuperation. I had to get down to the coast and sort out things. And then, on Sunday, I started looking after the preparations mm. for our first live show of the year. Yes, in Manchester. At the Dance House. Yeah. You put a tweet out saying it was on September the 9th. Yeah, I meant, I meant sorry, April the 9th. Yeah. Saturday, April the 9th. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be great, kids, and it's going to be... Kids. A, it's going to be a, w- a weekend of bladderation mm. because isn't the Manchester Marathon on the Sunday? Uh, the Grand National is on the same day as well. Right, the Grand National on the Saturday. On the Saturday. Yeah, in fact, you picked probably the busiest sporting weekend. We have, yeah. Marathon, uh, Manchester Marathon on mm. the Sunday. Uh, there's some other great... Anthony Joshua is fighting. Anthony Joshua, is that, in, where's that? In Manchester. In Manchester, yeah, yeah that's right. right. Manny Pacquiao's fighting as well that night uh, where? in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Yeah. But also, isn't there some great rock star having a show in Manchester on the same night? Um, I'm not sure about no, that. No, there is, there is. Was there? Well, didn't we compete against Noel Gallagher last time we went to Birmingham? When we were in Birmingham, yes, he was in yes. Nottingham. That's oh, he's in Nottingham. I don't think it? Noel Gallagher's in Manchester. Though. No, he's not. It's he not might Noel be somewhere Gallagher. else. It's uh, some some top rock star mm. has got a concert on in Manchester that night. Oh, probably. So I'm I'm amazed that um, we've almost sold out all our tickets. Mm. There are a few left, kids. Get on to uh, the two mice. Yeah, you can well, do that. Well, got to get down with the kids when we have a live show. You know what I mean? Which kids? You know our, our followers, mm. and it's at the dance house. And it the dance is. house is Oxford Road. Mm. It's right? in the centre of town, unlike Salford, where we went last time. Uh, yeah, although Salford was a very nice theatre. We were, uh, it was lovely, nice no, it was very nice. And the fans there, yeah. But you but can't it... swear there now, can you? That's the problem. No, you can't, no. Mm. The only reason we moved to the dance house was because mm. actually they came to us and said, look, you know, we want to put a show on. Yeah. We saw you at Salford and we'd love you to do it in central Manchester, mm. so that's why we're doing it. Thank you very much indeed. And looking forward to it. Yeah, we are, very much so. Yes. Uh, Finger says this, can we have Porky agree on air to write his autobiography, guaranteed to be a bestseller? Uh, well, well, I'm only going to write that when I've actually come to the end, if you see what I mean. Well, if you wait too long, then the end will come before you finish the book. No, I will know. I will know when the moment is right. Don't really? worry about that. Well, like Arsene Wenger. Uh, yes. Very much so. Now, we're going to I, talk I, uh, witchcraft coming up next. We did Courtney not see it. Weber, uh, who's a mm. witch and priestess. We're going to find out what all the kerfuffle is uh, about all these people getting involved in witchcraft over in America. Excellent this is Talk Sport. On digital radio and 1089 and 1053 AM, Talk Sport. So it's just promise what is coming Believing he listened while laughing you flew He's spotting red, yellow, brown all over the sea This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on. Now, there's yeah. some funny, interesting uh, uh, stuff over the weekend about yes. how fashion has now suddenly p- picked up uh, some what you might call styles from uh, uh, from witches and, and, and lots of fashion designers are apparently are now about? designing uh, outfits uh, which are inspired by, you know, lots of things like large mm. black hats, crystals, mm. pentagrams, black dresses, that kind of thing. And we thought we should speak to a, a real witch to find out whether this is in any way a good thing uh, or whether it's something that, uh, uh, that, that perhaps they don't agree with. Mm. Courtney Webber uh, is a real witch. She's a witch and a priestess. Courtney, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the show. 
Oh, thank you. Good morning to you as well. It's still night here in New York. Yeah, yeah of course. It I is. mean, obviously, yeah. this is quite an important time of year, isn't it? With the old spring equinox going on and and, yes. uh, uh, and everything. What does that What does that mean in the in 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 the uh, uh, in the witchcraft business? Well, it's one of our eight holidays, and it's the beginning of springtime. And for us, it's really a, pu- a period of renewal and gathering strength. We take the winter time to rest and rejuvenate. Now, come spring, it's time to really put your life forward, put yourself back in action. I myself will be celebrating next weekend with my goddaughters. We're going to be planting seeds in Central Park. Okay. <laughs> and, what, and, and what do you make of some of these uh, sort of trendy fashion uh, uh, gurus who are, who are suddenly looking at uh, some of the things that you might see more uh, on Halloween that people are wearing? Well, I think it's fantastic. It's really fun to see such interesting and lovely things in the fashion world these days. And it seems to be, it seems to come and go as a trend. I mean, I remember, I mean, I'm a, I'm a child of the nineties. So I remember seeing um, the, the influx of witchy clothing into the mainstream after the movie, the craft. And um, it that kind of be, uh, kept going through the early you know, t- um, 21st century. And it seems like it's returning now. So it really comes and goes with the ages. And so I'm not surprised to see it coming back. Now, Courtney, can you tell me, please, exactly what is the role of a witch in the United States today? We're told it's currently the fastest growing spiritual ideology in the USA. From my own point of view, one of my old aunties used to be a a Pendleton witch, and Pendleton is a hill in, in, in Blackburn, Lancashire. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, have you? Uh, I have. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was a Pendleton witch. In you never told me she was a Pendleton she witch. She was, she was, and uh, she had a broomstick and all that kind of stuff for the effect of when children used to come around and see her in a house and all that. But you know, historically, witches have the reputation of being from the darker side. What what is it about witchcraft these days that can enlighten us? I think that the biggest draw for witchcraft is an idea of spirituality being unique and for your own person. In the United States right now, we're really seeing a movement away from organized religion. More and more people are calling themselves spiritual but not religious. And the one thing that witchcraft offers is an absolutely um, personalized Mm. individual relationship to whatever you believe your higher power is. In addition, we're also seeing a rise in environmental concerns, and witchcraft places a very specific um, source of divinity on the natural world and the planet itself. And so with this rise, environmentalism also comes with the idea of the earth being sacred and it being the center of spiritual practice. So it's a bit paganish, is it? Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, it's a, it's a pagan belief, I see. So so the old Macbeth didn't do a lot of good then when he the opening lines of Macbeth, <laughs> you know, we three witches, you know, round the cauldron, dropping dead mice in and all that kind of stuff. None of that going on these days. Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Most of the witches that I know are all about um, um, cleaning up this planet and helping out animals and doing good for others. Mm, but that well, is the, that is the image, isn't it? Though I mean, you may say, well, maybe from people who don't know much about it. But you know, the the the, the question that most people would ask me before I talk to you was, you know, do, do you do do you do spells? Um, and do witches do spells? Absolutely. Spells are a concentrated form of prayer. They normally have some sort of physical rituals involved with it, such as lighting a candle. I mentioned planting seeds earlier. That's a kind of of, of casting of a spell. And um, so whereas prayer, somebody is, is offering their words to a higher power in witchcraft, you're doing the same thing, but there's got to be some sort of physical ritual involved in it. Mm. Now, this is very interesting. So in a way, because you're in the United States... Does this all go back perhaps to Native Americans who used to worship nature, Uh, you know, used to worship the animals, hawks, birds, that sort of thing? Well, it's... it's I'm, there are certainly some parallels. What's interestingly enough is a lot of American witchcraft was influenced by England. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so the English revival of witchcraft in the early 20th century made its way over here, which is what a lot of people um, are practicing. The, na- the different religions of, native, of um, the Native Americans, it's mm. really important to note that there's not just one Native American religion. We're talking about hundreds of sure. different faiths and spiritualities among the different nations mm. um, of this country. So um, while there certainly are some similarities, I think that there would probably be just as many differences. I think if we all sat down and we went through each one, we'd find parallels. We'd also find differences among them. But that is what is interesting is that a lot of American paganism is influenced by Europe. 
I've I see. seen these uh, statistics mm. that, you know, it's uh, believed to be the sort of fastest growing spiritual ideology in the mm. USA. I mean, have, have, have things changed? I mean, you talk about the uh, the early kind of settlers and there was the Salem witch trials and all that kind of thing that yeah. went on in New England. I mean, to people, if you're, if, say, if you're going for a job or something like that and, and you put religion down, I don't know what you put down. Do you put down a, a, you're, you're a witch and does that have any kind of trouble for you? Uh, does it stop you getting work? Well, in the United States, by law, they're not supposed, they're not allowed to ask us about our religion. Mm. So um, if I'm wearing my pentacle, there's always a, a possibility, but that has never been an issue for me, um, probably because I'm living in New York City and um, this is a very, I mean, people just really don't care. And no, I quite. Work at a, <laughs> I actually work at an interfaith seminary where people um, are excited to have a witch among them. But there are parts of the United States where people can face a lot of persecution. We have some very, very heavily, heavily conservative Christian areas, as I'm sure you know. Mm. And that can make it very difficult for practitioners of witchcraft to be open about their faith and to get work. But that's, that is something that we have here is um, protection of our own religion. And so if anyone comes to the United States and they're trying to get a job and someone asks their religion, that the, that employer is breaking the law. No, I understand that. Yeah. Courtney, if I wanted to study more about your spiritual ideology, is there, is there a witch Bible? Is there a sort of Koran or a Holy Bible or something like that? Where would I go and find the scriptures of Spiritual a Quran, a, a, a Quran, a, spir, a spiritual ideology for for witches. Witches don't have a central Bible because all of our our religion is based on personal experience. There mm-hmm. are many many books out there. In fact, there are. Um, a couple of books that are called witches' Bibles, or so to speak. One is um, actually by a very well-known um, English witch named Janet Ferrer, and she, with her late husband, wrote A Witch's Bible. And it talks a lot about um, the history of some of these nature-based uh, practices sure. and holidays. Sure. And um, even now she said she's, that's, it's, it's, it's grown quite a bit, and so it would be I mean, perhaps a little bit antiquated now what this practice is, and I think she would even agree with that if, I said, if she heard me say it, mm. but it has a lot of the history into it. So I think that's one thing that's really, really wonderful about our faith that sets us apart is you're not going to find dogma amongst our ranks. It's all about what have you experienced to be true, and are you living with respect for other people and respect for your planet? Yeah. And, and do people ask you to, to, I mean, you were talking about, you know, different, or I suppose, definitions of spells. Do people ask you to yeah. kind of help them out with, with things? And, you know, if I was to say to you, you know, my, my, my co-hosts, uh, uh, the football team here are not doing very well. Could you put a spell on, on them to make them play better? Something like that. <laughs> well, it would depend. <laughs> so, yes, people do come to me and ask for assistance with spell work. And sometimes I, I will do it and sometimes I won't. I feel sometimes that it's better for the person to address it themselves, whether it's through making changes in their life or casting their own spells and bring their own energy that way. But there have been times where I have lent a hand spiritually to assist someone. But it's not something I, I commonly do just because I, I'm not sure it's always the best thing for the person if somebody else is getting involved with their energy, so to speak. Mm, mm. Tell, tell me this, Courtney. If a group of witches get together, I suppose you'd be called a coven, how do you conduct a... <laughs> not necessarily. No, no, no. How do you conduct a ceremony? You know, we have Church of England, we have uh, mosques, we have, um, you know, uh, Jewish people go to synagogues. Where, do witches literally gather in a wood late oh, yes. at night? And do you um, employ nakedness, which is often talked about in sort of... Why does it always come down to nakedness with well, you? Well, because uh, you read about the way witches go about things and, and it seems appreciation of the human form in its, uh, you know, in its rawest form is part of the spirituality. Well, that was more common in the 60s, which I think was really a reaction in part of the free love movement. That's so many of the things you read about witches getting naked was yeah. really about them being hippies running around in the woods. Mm-hmm. And um, my coven, we live in New York City. We really can't get out into the woods or the park at 2 o'clock in the morning unless you want to get arrested or murdered. So we generally sure. meet, in the, <laughs> we meet in the afternoon yep. um, in my apartment or in someone else's apartment. And it depends on what um, what is called for at that time. We might have a meditation where we just where we focus on – um, how we can better ourselves, or if we need to actually raise energy, say somebody needs healing, we might bring them into the circle and raise energy through song and dance to make that person feel better. I see. And so, and, and the practice of, of planting seeds, is that to mm-hmm. renew life, start life? and all? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And what sort absolutely. of seeds? What sort of seeds, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, well, it really, I, 
I think you really want to make sure that the seeds you pick are something that is conducive to the environment and would not be an invasive species. Right. The seeds I have now are some watermelon seeds that actually picked up at a UN Peacekeeper Award ceremony that took place just last week that a friend of mine was receiving a very important award, mm -hmm. and they were passing out these packets that said seeds of change. And I yeah. thought, well, this is wonderful. They, they've already been imbued with the powers of peace. So right. I'm going to take these with me when I meet with my goddaughters who are eight years old now. Mm -hmm. And so that we can, I can ask these children, what kind of world do you want to see? What world do you want to grow up in? And mm -hmm. then when they um, whisper their intentions onto the seeds, we're going to plant them together. So they've got a couple of layers of power there. One from the UN, which I think is going to be pretty yeah. powerful itself. But then also from children, where there's no greater magic than the love of children. And if, yeah, and if Porky, who seems to be very mm. enthused by all this, wanted to get uh, uh, in, uh, uh, sort of uh, recruited into your into your movement, what does he have to do? Do you have like a, uh, a sort of initiation ceremony or anything like that? It depends on which group you go to. With my group, you would come and visit us several times, and we get a feel for each other. And make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to our philosophy and ethics and that we all get along really well. And then we would bring you in. Um, in England, I'm not sure how people connect with each other. Of course, mm. with social media these days, it's so much easier for people to find faith groups that they're liking than they could, say, 30 years ago. Sure. But I do know that England is full of wonderful, wonderful pagan and witchcraft communities, especially in Glastonbury and those areas. Oh, absolutely. So I, I just, yeah, I would say just doing a simple web search and, and finding who has open circles that I might be able to attend, and you'll find something. Yeah. But I tell people that are interested in witchcraft, keep searching around, because sometimes people get so excited, they say, oh, this is, I found a group, this is mm. a group, and then they're not quite sure if it's the group they want to stay in. Sure. But I say, you know, it, this with, that's what's one of the wonderful things about the growing witchcraft movement, is that it's so much easier to find people that really can, can that you can really connect with and identify with. Yeah, no, I, I can see all that in Glastonbury as well. One final question, Courtney, what effect, <laughs> and what did you think of the Harry Potter films. <laughs> I'm just jealous I didn't write the series first. Well, obviously, from a financial point of view, sure. But <laughs> yes. did it, it must have provoked an interest in... I mean, I know it was wizardry rather than witches, although, of course, there yes. were plenty of young ladies involved, but that must have stimulated interest in the whole thought process. Oh, I th absolutely think it did. And I think, because um, like, those came out not too long, um, or even maybe a little before the Lord of the Rings series came out, I noticed mm -hmm. that there's been an increase in interest in magic and fantasy. I think it's because we're living in a really scary time in our world right now between what's happening with the environment and what's happening with all of the vi different violent conflicts. I mean, at least in the United States, we've got a madman who wants to take over our country. That's a pretty scary thought. And so I think that there is a comfort in people um, embracing the, the idea of magic and thinking I can change my world. I don't have to be, I don't have to be a politician to make things different in, in the places where I live. Mm. And that's what, that's what I feel has been the real renaissance in magic these days has been a response to, you know, People really wanting to make their world a better place. Yeah, yeah. Well, well Courtney, we all want you, that. We thank you so that. much for uh, taking yes. the time at all. It's Courtney Weber there, uh, who is a witch. Uh, she's uh, her Twitter is on our Twitter actually. Mm -hmm. so you can find her at the Coco Witch. Yeah. A lot of things I'm going to ask you about some of those questions coming yes. up very shortly. Uh, we are the two mics. This is Talk Sport. 262 miles, 330 yards, 10 days, one intrepid television presenter. I'm Jeff Stelling, and this month I'll be walking 10 marathons in 10 days for Prostate Cancer UK, going all the way from Hartlepool to Wembley to help beat a disease that kills one man every hour. This week, listen to Hawksby and Jacobs every day as they check in with Jeff's Men United March. Sponsor Jeff and find out more at menunitedmarch.org. Walking 10 marathons in 10 days in March. That's unbelievable, Jeff. Deciding which direction to take with your pension can be a bit nerve-wracking, but PensionWise is here to guide you. Set up by the government, we offer free, impartial guidance on the routes you could take and what to watch out for. Book a telephone or face-to-face -face appointment now with one of our friendly team. Call 0800 138 1888. Pension wise, your money, your choice. Get a generous helping of the latest odds and tasty tips with Paddy's Punts every weekday afternoon from four on Drive with Durham and Goffey on Talk Sport with Paddy Power. You're welcome. With the form on the football, but what a game! The going on the GGs, and they're off. The crack on the cricket, six, and lashings of Paddy's famous generosity. Ah, come on, gives a break to me a bit of crack, isn't it? Get your tips while they're hot with Paddy's Punts weekday afternoons from four with Adrian Durham and Darren Goff on Talk Sport with Paddy Power. You're welcome. I 
put a spell on you. Because of mine. Is this the one you were looking for? That's the one I was looking for. It's good the screaming, the screaming Jay Hawkins one. Really? Yeah, well, it's pretty good, isn't it? Mm. It's all right. Mm. Better than mm. your version. Jeff the Gooner says, Hi, lads, you don't need a spell to make Everton play better. You need a miracle. <laughs> And there's a lot of people saying especially uh, funny. you're talking nonsense about your auntie mm. uh, yeah. because uh, it's Pendle Hill, uh, says Moss. That's right, yeah. Uh, you should say Pendle, didn't you? Or Pendleton. Or no, something. I said Pendleton, but right. I mean, it's a long, long time since you went there. It's but... Pendle Hill and it's in Dingle uh, Land Burnley, he says. Dingle no, Land? No, it's near Blackburn. Dingle Land. It's Blackburn because Pendle Hill, she, mm. li- she lived at the base of Pendle Hill. Right. And so we, as little kids, we used to go running up Pendle Hill looking for witches. Uh-huh. And she had Did a witch's hat. No, of course not. She had a witch's hat in her in her house and a witch's broom, mm. and all the local kids used to come round and see it because she was a member of the Pendle Hill Witches Association. Didn't that worry you? She had the full cloak and 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 the uh, you know the pointy hat and everything. Mm. No, it didn't worry me at she all. Never put you a know. spell on you. She never put a spell on me, man. She was uh, you know she's a kind old lady and all that kind of stuff. You know mm. what I mean? So so no, nobody ever used to worry about it. Steve's wondering if the if the witch we just had on could get the rest of your heart working. Even the great Doctor Banner can't do that. Well. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. And Roy says, can you ask her to do a spell on the person who delivers Porky's journals? Please make him stop wittering on about them. No, no, no. They they provide me with such knowledge. By the way, I've found a way to lose weight. Have you? If you want to, which I think you should think about. Well, you think I should think about? Yeah. What about yourself? Well, I'm in the process at the moment because mm. I am going for a consultation with uh, my medical team. With Dr Banner? Maybe. Oh, really? Maybe. Even more reason to get him on, In then. the next, um, mm. you know, month or so. Something uh-huh. like that. You know, so decided. we get it like a before and after. Maybe, maybe. But anyway, look... Um, so are you saying you're going to lose some weight, then? Well, I'm just giving up certain things. Are you? Alcohol, I've given up now. Since when? I've renounced it. Since S- when? Since Cheltenham. Really? Since Cheltenham. What, so you haven't had a drink over the weekend? I have not. Apart from Friday? I have not. I have not. Mm. Okay. I've renounced it um, for a good period of time. For what? For Lent or something? Uh, Mind you, Lent's nearly over now. Well, for Easter, actually. Mm. Yeah, Easter. Well, Easter's going to be over by next weekend. Won't be doing anything on Easter. Won't be doing anything over Easter. What are you doing for Easter Sunday? Easter Sunday, I'm mm. doing Clash of the Titans on Sunday afternoon. So you're sorry, actually working. Sorry, didn't I tell you about that? Oh, no. sorry, I forgot. No, that no. one slipped out, didn't oh, it? Oh, didn't you get invited to do it? Oh, I don't, sorry. No, I don't, oh, do, I don't yeah. do Clash of the Titans. Oh, no, of course not. That's right, yeah. What other you. Titans are on with you? Um, well, you know. You don't know, do you? I don't want to say too much about you it. You don't know, do you? Of course I know. They haven't told you. Of course I know. Well, who are they then? Well, I can't, you know, I'm not sure it's been scheduled yet, so it'd be Oh, so it might not happen then. It will happen. So you're working on the Lord's Day? I'm working on the Lord's Day. Right. Okay. But that's I think work is is a uh, very, very good way of thanking the Lord for being able to live in this wonderful world of ours, you know, and is having that right? the health to do it still. Mm. Now, what is so it t- no sort of family hearthside dinner for you then? Uh, that will probably take place on Easter Monday. Easter Monday? I know it won't because we're working Easter Monday. Well, no, we're Easter take, Monday. Could take place on Good Friday. That's good right, Friday. I just remembered. Yeah, Good Friday. Mm. From here on Good Friday, yeah. I will shoot coastal, OK? Right. And uh, and do something there with the family on Good Friday. Well, in Gosport. Uh, we're having round to your place. Maybe you should yeah, make could them... Yeah, could do. Maybe you should cook a roast. Yes, could That'd do. That'd be great fun. That could be You could video it and we could all have a good laugh on Now, Monday. talking about eating, I found out now how I can help you lose weight. Do you know yeah, what you do? On. Every time you eat, mm. right, you sit yeah. down, you put your food on the table, yeah. stick earplugs in your ear. Mm. If you listen to yourself eating, you, re- you, you become revolted at yourself for eating so much. What? You've... Yeah, well, unlike you, yeah. I don't sit down to eat on my own. So yeah. I use the eating process yeah. to actually have a very, very sort of sociable situation. Well, OK, we'll make I it mean, unsociable. If... Well, no, if you want to sit no. there on your own with earplugs in, no. that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's what you should do. That's what you should do. I could put earplugs in every time I take the next train journey with you. That would be helpful. What, what you can do is, because of the industry we work in, take a pair of headphones home, because, of course, you don't have your own designer ones like me. Well, those me. cheap Sennheiser ones that you excuse bought. Excuse me, excuse me, expensive. And you took a pair home before, didn't you, from here? That weren't actually yours. Oh, no, no, no. I, I paid for them. Did paid you? For them, yeah. Anyway, anyway, the point of my story is mm. you can either put those on or, better still, stick earplugs in your mm. ear. If all else fails, yeah. you can use bread as earplugs. Bread. You know that, don't you? Yeah, that's acceptable. I've never tried putting bread in no. my ears, no. And, and then if you masticate mm. whilst you have deprived yourself of uh, exterior sound, uh-huh. you will listen to yourself munching, literally. Yeah. Try it sometime and you will find... Yeah, I'm... Imitating yeah. eating as although I'm not eating obviously yeah. as I'm talking to you 
Well, and so you, wouldn't that put you off easy altogether? Yeah, that's the whole idea. Well, and as sure you, there is no safe as diet you clash that says your you, teeth you, together, you can't eat anything. You can hear the clash of your teeth mm. <clears throat> resounding through your skull and yeah. your head, and it puts you off eating. Really? And, and, no, I, I swear to you, it's a really good way to... Um, um, here we are. This is from one of my science journals. Uh, sound is typically the forgotten food sense. But if people were more focused on the sound food makes, it would reduce consumption, OK? Mm. Maybe bad manners, but eating noisily can be good for your waistline. Mm. You know, you can actually nosh your well, food. I don't eat nosh your food. Though. I don't eat noisily. I don't eat no- noisily either, but it sounds noisy if you put earplugs or bread in your, in your ears. Mm. Well, Half the volunteers who took part in an exercise uh, described... Um, uh, burr, burr. Yes, food. Once they're wearing uh, the, their ear, <laughs> their earplugs, have as, you not prepared this particular part? As crispy, crispy. Yeah, crispy. Crispy what? But also, they say it makes your food taste. Who's advising this, by the way? This is a science magazine. By whom? But I mean, some study must have been done by somebody. Yeah, it was. A, it was well, a study been done by. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. But it makes food more tasteful, mm. and you don't eat as much of it because you feel that you've been satisfied with the benefits that food give you uh, a lot what, sooner. Orally. Uh, sorry, orally, you mean? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and what I'm saying is, by the time you've got through half the food on your plate, mm. you feel completely satisfied with the food you've got because you've been listening to yourself to eat. I see. Okay. Well, um, I think the point about... And then you stop having, eating. Well, the point about having a social dinner is that you probably eat less when you're talking to people as well, don't you? And if you're sitting down on your own and just lobbing a load of food into your well, mouth... do you know what? Then you're going to eat more than if you're sitting there talking to people and, you know, having, you know having sort of social intercourse It's funny you should say that, but um, I have a group of friends I sometimes go out with. Not often, what? but sometimes, OK? A group of friends? Yeah, and they always you say to me... how many friends? And we always, you know, we always go to expensive restaurants, and they always say to me... Always say, Mike, order the cheapest on the menu. I said, why? Because you never eat it. Mm. So we go right through the course of, you know, two or three courses of meals right. over a space of two hours mm. or two and a half hours, three right. hours. And I never hardly what, touch you mean, the food on my you don't place. shut up? Well, it's because I like engaging in conversation. So, I mean, they always point out to me, you know... Well, why don't you eat when they're talking? But the answer to that is that you never uh, stop talking. No, and the waiter comes round and says, have you finished, sir? And they've all finished. And I say, oh, no, just give me a minute, please. And then half an hour later, he comes round. Mm. And he says, have you finished now, sir? And I say, oh, yeah, I suppose I have, really. Yeah. But I notice that very little has been removed from my plate. Yeah. Because I, when I eat... Oh, because I, you haven't stopped talking, that's the point. You've been monopolising the conversation, which is what you do all I the don't, time. I don't, I don't monopolise conversation, believe me. You do me. all the time. No, I don't. It's just I get interested. And so, sometimes when I'm listening to Who other people... friends, anyway, that you're talking well, about? Well, never mind who they are. When I'm listening to other people's conversations... Mm. I get as uh, involved, yeah. you know, with their conversation as I do with mine. Yeah. And did they ever say, um, would you like another glass of wine, Mr Parry? And then presumably your glass is empty, so they keep refilling that. Sometimes that happens. But mm. as I say, I have renounced drink for the immediate future. How long for? Uh, well, it will be for a period of time. Well, give me an, give me an idea. A week? A month? A no, day? No, no. Maybe... Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. You heard it here. Uh, yes. Porky's not going to have a drink. If anybody spots him anywhere having yes. a drink, obviously you have to go up and take it off him yes. uh, and tell him that he's broken his own rule. Indeed. This is Talk Sport. Talk Sport, we are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on. And, of course, winners and losers coming up in the next hour. Uh, let's see how uh, well-prepared Mr Parry is. Yes. Uh, by the way, you know that Spotify list that I told you about last week? Spotify? Uh, the Spotify playlist of all of the music that uh, gets played uh, on the oh, show. Oh, yes, I saw that. has been very, very uh, sort of enthusiastically taken up by a now, lot of people. you tweeted me a list of... Uh, is it the two mics music chart? Yeah, well, basically it's yes. all the music that gets played on the show. Right. I mean, not okay. every, every, every single song, but right. one of the, most of the ones that get played as a, on a regular basis. All right, Okay. And I put it on our Facebook page, and right. a lot of people were asking for it on Twitter. So, Excellent, I like uh, that. It's out there if you want to find it. It I was like by Ben Parrish, in fact, it was ben our, one of our listeners who put it together, which was very good. Hey, by the way, you know, mm. I was telling you about uh, how to cut down on your food by putting earplugs in your ear when yes. you're eating. Right. Uh, I've also discovered, because I've been musing on this for about a year now, mm. that 
um, you can now get your teeth done by ultrasound instead of having fillings. Did you know that? Uh, I think I did know that, but I don't understand how that would work. You send ultrasound waves mm. through your jaw right. and your gums. Well, how do you mean you can send them? Well, you go to your dentist and right. he, 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 he sticks them through your jaw. And it, um... But how do you make a filling out of ultrasound? Well, you don't. What happens is the, they've now discovered mm. it, and this is like real sort of uh, science fiction type uh, medicine. Is it? That if you send ultrasound waves yeah. through the gum and the jaws, uh-huh. the um, nerve endings mm. start activating yeah. and repair the damage to your teeth themselves. Really? And, and, and might even grow new teeth. Rubbish. No, honest to God. Absolute con. Hon- honest to God. And I tell you why. Honest to God. As I... if that makes it somehow right. Yeah. yeah. And I tell you why I'm so <laughs> interested in it. What's your problem? It's Will not you really stop a this? scientific expression. It is. It? Honest to God. Yes, yes. Because I've been worried about having two screws put into my um, well, you've my got a gum. couple of loads loose, haven't you? No, I no, I've got two gaps in my in my teeth, and for I mean, ages my dentist's been saying, "Look, we'll put implants in." Yeah, yeah. But the problem with the implant is they mm. put a screw in first, right. which stays there for six months, uh-huh. and which you can sometimes catch your tongue on and that kind of stuff. Well, no, they'll put a, a crown yeah, on. Surely. Yeah, they will. They'll just leave uh, a big and, nail sticking out of the middle no, of your mouth. Well, that's what worries me. And no, then, I don't think they're going to do that. And then they put two implanted teeth in. But I think that most of my teeth by now must be like um, false or crowns or something, because mm. t- touch wood... Yeah. Touch my own head here. I haven't... You uh, the time, by the way. I haven't I'm had sure a, a time filling for, for ages. Yeah. But this uh, this report about... Uh, t- yeah, you can zap your teeth with ultrasound for a few minutes. Once awakened, the nerve ending starts to multiply in number and turn into the cells that make up teeth. So far, the work has been done on cells extracted from rat's teeth, but it can work rats in... Rat's teeth. Yeah, it can work on human right. beings. right. Says Damon Wolsey. Right. Yeah, who's he? Sci- scientific advisor to the British Dental Association. Excellent. Right. He believes it will be possible to heal human right. teeth in the mouth or grow them. That's enough. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Again, lots of complimentary tweets about that interview with um, uh, the witch, by the yes, way. Yes, good. Because uh, uh, Courtney, who uh, has also said she very much enjoyed it as well. Good. Uh, Lee says this, uh, MG, Porky's eating will get an extra loud echo because of the extra big space between his ears. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? And uh, uh, Richard says, so Porky's worried about getting a screw between his teeth. He needs it. He's a screw loose. Uh, yeah, that's um, very nice. Well, what about some of these complimentary ones about Well, I don't Courtney. want to read all those out. Because, well, I, I'd uh, like to no hear one. I'd like to hear one because it's a tribute to her no, like coming to read, on our show. Uh, uh, well, here's one from, all right, yeah. here's one from, let's yeah. see, uh, uh, Lincoln, who says, enjoyed listening to you on the two mics. Yes. Uh, that's addressed to uh, to her, who's at the Coco Witch. Oh, I see. Yeah, right? it's okay. uh, and she said, a fab interview with two delightful British gents. Oh, that's very kind of you. She Thank you very mind much. mind the, the usual question about nakedness, which you always seem to sort of f- focus on whenever we interview any women. No, no, I don't. Why do you get naked? Well, hang on, haven't you well, read asked the... asked the woman who was rowing across the, the Atlantic, didn't you, yeah. when she was naked? And what happened, what happened when, when the, they next featured a woman crew rowing across the Atlantic? Well, then that was when they had a rather unfortunate blooper on uh, uh, on BBC Breakfast. Because the woman was naked, right? Yeah, uh, she was naked from the waist down. Yes, exactly. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. And witches uh, traditionally dance around naked, don't they? In well, not covens, according in, to, not according in to woods Courtney. and all that kind of stuff. Well, they do by hi- history. Now, listen, I want to tell you an absolute phenomenon. Um, we've talked already about Mike Ashley and the interview you gave about... An absolute about... phenomenon. I'll tell you what's an absolute phenomenon. Yeah. was that uh, crash uh, that happened at the uh, Australian Grand Prix. Utterly amazing. you tweeted about that. Utterly amazing. Mm. I mean, when he first came off the track, mm. he just hit the sort of side barrier yeah. and then he sort of came back on and you thought, oh, that will just... Well, no, stop. except because the reason... When, when, you, saw the, uh, yeah. when you saw the kind of the, the replay, yes. you didn't realise it was actually all in slow motion, otherwise you couldn't actually tell because it was so uh, fast. No, what happened was... 90 miles an hour. The front of the car dug into the gravel yeah, yeah. And, and that made it... Like, um, but it was already flying wasn't it? before yeah, it hit yeah. the gravel. It was flying through the air. It was unbelievable. Incredible that he got out of that. It was unbelievable. And and you know, a how he survived, and b I, I mean, his quotes were incredible. Mm. He said it was like drowning. He said I could see blue sky, then yeah. gravel, then blue sky, then gravel. Yeah. So obviously he's spinning around. Yeah, yeah. He said, and when I eventually got out of the car, I had no idea where I was. He did was look so, a bit dazed, didn't he? I was so far from the track. Yeah. It was amazing. But I said what I watched over the weekend yes. as well, which I've been meaning to watch for a long time. Mm. Uh, was that movie Rush? Have you seen that? Uh, it's the one about James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. No. Good. It's fantastic. Good. You've got to see it. Really? You've absolutely got to see it. Because I've yeah. never seen the previous one about Ayrton Senna. That's supposed to be very good yeah. as well. Have you seen that? No, yes, I have seen that. You have seen Senna. that. That's Senna. And, and that's, that that's, that's also brilliant. Yeah, right. but I, enjoy, I, I kind of enjoyed the, the Rush one better in a way. Yeah. Because I kind of remembered the whole James Hunt era. Is it a film or a docudrama? It's a film. Film. Yeah. Hmm. And does the James Hunt character come the guy, over? The guy who's playing him looks exactly yeah. like it. Yeah, right. You know. And does he talk with that sort of uh, great British accent? He does, but he's an Australian actor. 
actor, funnily enough. He's a guy that plays Thor. Yes, but does he talk with that great British accent well, that it, James Well, qu- yeah, it wasn't quite as posh as that. I, I can... Yes, I... No, it wasn't. No, you're doing some kind of old Tory law. Murray, uh, Murray, what's his name? You know, he used to commentate mm. with... He's 93 now, by the way. Murray. Yeah, Murray Walker. Murray Walker, yeah. And uh, Murray Walker once said to him, And James, do you think the engine in the car in front of Damon Hill will be feeling the pressure? And Hunt said... Uh, no, Murray, it won't actually, because um, cars are inanimate objects and don't have feelings. Mm. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, but it was uh, brilliant. Now, listen, the phenomenon I was going to tell you yeah, about. Yeah, go on. So, Mike Ashley, on the back of a national newspaper tomorrow morning, mm. I wish I had never bought Newcastle, no. and we've already been into that, and he didn't actually say that. Well, he says he regrets uh, getting involved in football, doesn't he? That's Exa- basically exactly. Quote. Exactly. But then I go to the front of this paper, mm. and quite remarkably, quite yeah. absolutely remarkably, uh, it's Mike Ashley. Yeah. Mike Ashley. I'd love to box Millie Band's ears. Boss fights back over Ed's attack. Mm. And this story says sports direct tycoon Mike Ashley says he wants to fight Ed Miliband for taking a swing at his company. In an extraordinary outburst, billionaire Mr Ashley hit back over the former Labour leader's claims of staff having to endure Victorian working practices. Mr Ashley said, I'd love to get him in the boxing ring with a pair of heavyweight gloves and box his ears. Mm. He ought to come here and see it for himself, spend a week with me personally. He can stay in one of the company houses in one of the bedrooms that I stay in. He can come and do all the jobs I do, picking up things in the warehouse, working in the office, and what you will see is that there are no Victorian practices here. Mm. And then he goes on to say, making wild claims like that has affected staff morale, customer numbers, and my share price. Mm. I mean, that well, is, an, is amazing, that's go, an amazing statement. Well, this is why he won't go in front of the MPs that he keeps being asked to go in front of to justify what it is that he does, right? Doesn't he have to go in front of the MPs eventually? Well, I don't know. If, if, and I, I, don't I, think I thought it, the law in this country was, if you're summoned to a parliamentary committee... I'm not sure about that. I think there's an issue of whether... The, I think there are various different ways they can ask you to come. Yeah, I, I think see. at this point they've just asked him to come. I, see. I think they can order him to come if there's a proper inquiry going on. I, but I don't think that's the case at the moment. I think if you work in public office and you're summoned, like the Chief Constable of... You know, yeah, I think if you're a public, yeah, uh, you know, or, or the a, Metropolitan Police a public employee, he looks like he's got a few problems now, old Hogan Howe. But anyway, that's, yeah, that's, uh, another, that's another story. story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what he says mm. here, uh, he says, mm. I have, I've had tons of fun, but I do mm. regret getting involved in football. The answer yes. uh, is um, whether he's kind of having mm. trouble at Newcastle. He says, I haven't been able to make the difference that I wanted to make mm. in football. That's I wanted right. to help Newcastle. I wanted to make it better. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And he says he did it with his company, mm. um, but he hasn't been able to do it with the team. That's right. That's so right. sports direct, he says, has done well. Yeah, uh, but but with Newcastle, he hasn't. Yeah. So I guess the fact that they've said I now regret buying Newcastle mm. is, is a kind of a um, I don't know. It's I an still, interpretation, I st- isn't it? Of what I still he think said. it's very misleading because if you're a Newcastle fan and you read that headline, I wish I had never bought Newcastle. Mm. That makes you feel like the guy who owns your club has written your club off. And I think it is misleading, honestly. I, we all understand about headlines. We worked in tabloid newspapers for 25 years. Yeah. But I would never have allowed that headline to be published, to be perfectly honest. You would never have allowed it? No. Really? No. Well, well, on I, account of your huge ethical kind of principles? Well, that you're talking huge about. ethical principles, but also just misleading not only the reading public, but, you know, hundreds of thousands, literally, of Newcastle fans. Mm. Because Mr Ashley didn't say that. He said, uh, I, I have regrets about getting well, involved in football. It's well, a totally different well, thing. Well, no, there's interpretation. I mean, if he says mm. he regrets getting involved in football, yeah. and then he says he, he hasn't been able to make the changes and the difference at Newcastle that you yeah. hope to make, yeah. then you can say that the two things are almost the same. Well, I, 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 I don't actually uh, accept that. Now, um, now we haven't, yes. you know what we haven't done? What? We haven't had a look at our favourite paper yet, The New Day. Oh, yeah, well, The New, um, the new Day. Do you know what is interesting? Mm. We have an old colleague yeah. uh, called Roy Greenslade. Yeah who has self-appointed himself as he's a now, great... Well, he's now a professor of journalism. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's a professor of journalism. I don't know how you become a professor of journalism, because if you're a professor of science, mm. it's because you've written some fantastic scientific papers. And you have a qualification. And you have a qualification. Well. And, 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 and your PhD or something. And your papers and your new theories are discussed at, medical, mm. at, at scientific conferences all around the world. That's yeah. how you become a professor. But uh, nobody could ever describe any working journalist in Fleet Street over the years as a man who could elevate himself to professorship. Mm. It's just ridiculous well, I think he is a professor at City University, though. So yeah, he does yeah, actually. Yes, but who gave, him the, well. who gave him the title of professor? Well, because I think he's a, he's a, he works there now. And I'm not picking on uh, Roy Greenslade, by mm. the way. There's a few of them. There's uh, Donald Trelford, is described as a professor, the uh-huh. former editor of The Observer. Yes. 
A uh, man who was, I think, only five foot one inches tall, wasn't he? I don't know. Perhaps he still is. <laughs> well, I should think he's, he's changed his height <laughs> exactly, over yeah, the yeah. years. And, Seems uh, unlikely. An old colleague of mine, actually, a gentleman called Paul Potts, who was oh, yeah. uh, he was the chief executive of the Press Association. Your former boss. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he's a visiting professor of journalism. Is he? I noticed at uh, a university in Sheffield. I'm is not he? sure whether it's Sheffield or Sheffield Hallam. Sheffield Hallam. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, the point of the story is. Uh, Mr Greenslade, who is self-appointed, mm. you know, the media commentator of all media commentators, particularly on newspapers yeah. in this country. Uh, I saw a piece written today, Media Guardian yeah, yeah. Um, uh, location, so uh-huh. to speak, uh, in which he detailed the problems that New Day has had and the reasons for it having a very rocky start, as yes. he described it. Well, they've got a great advert for themselves inside the paper, right near the back of the paper, oh, really? uh, where it's inviting people to throw a New Day party. Yeah, let's have a look here. What's yeah, you have to go like two back, two pages from three pages from the back. Oh yeah, we are looking for readers to become brand ambassadors for the new day. People mm. who will spread the news of this new newspaper among their local community, collate feedback from readers, and help up start up discussion groups on the big topics of the day. I can't believe that. Right. Looking for readers to become brand ambassadors. So it day. says that they'll send you a pack filled with ideas, discussion points, and ways in which you can spread the word about Britain's newest newspaper. Are they mad? Uh, well, <laughs> very possibly. <laughs> Thanking you, Sarah, you Jay Party. Alison. Who's Alison? Well, she's the editor. <laughs> well, you and I know that, but I mean, does the average reader know that? Now, listography on the back, which we always give a mention to. <laughs> oh, yeah. List your favourite places to go in your hometown. Oh, how rubbish go is on, that? Go on, give us three of them. Three well, places to go in your hometown. I'll, I'll make it Chester. Yeah. Chester well, Cathedral. Well, that is your hometown. Yeah, Chester Cathedral. Yeah. Uh, your old house. Yeah, 23 Old Grove. Yeah. And Grosvenor Park. And what about one of the pubs? Uh, yes, the, uh, the Diva Hotel. Yeah, there you go. Watergate Street. Easy to do. The Rue D, yeah. the, the, the first race course in the world and the only circular one to this day. Mm. The Tell River you. D, the boathouse on the River That's D. That's too many places. That's a pub. You have to edit them down. Uh, anyway, we're out of time, as ever. Uh, winners and losers coming up very, very shortly. I may have to shorten my list because I've got some very long lists of winners and losers, but we'll get to that very, very shortly. This is Talk Sport. Time for a new 16 plate van. Time for a Mercedes Benz Citan, Vito, or Sprinter. How about 0% APR and a service plan for just £10 a month across the whole model range? There's never been a better time than this March to drive away with a new 16-plate Mercedes-Benz van. Clock's ticking. Find out more at mbvans.co.uk. Business users only. Higher purchase only. Maximum term 36 months. Minimum deposit 20%. VAT at 20% applies. Credit approvals by 31st of March 2016. Mercedes-Benz Finance. So what does a good teacher make? (laughs) My teacher makes me want to put my hand up as fast as I can in class. My teacher makes me believe that I can be the best I really can. (laughs) My teacher just made me realise that not all subjects are bad. (laughs) Make a difference to thousands of lives, including your own. Tax-free bursaries are available to help you while you train. Teaching. Your future. Their future. Search Change to Teaching. Bursaries subject to eligibility. As every sports person knows, timing is everything. It can be the difference between standing on the podium and going home empty-handed. It can be the difference between a sweet first touch that finds the corner of the net and the missed kick that ends up in row Z. And when it comes to hereditary hair loss, timing is vital as well. Because the earlier you start using Regain for Men Extra Strength Scalp Foam, the higher your chances of success. An estimated 7.5 million men in the UK experience hereditary hair loss, many of them before they're 35. But fortunately, Regain is on hand with all the information and support you need to help you separate the facts from the fiction. If you've noticed you're starting to lose your hair, you need to understand exactly why it's happening and what you can do about it. And now, Regain has an app that gives you support and advice to track your progress and maintain your twice-daily routine. Download the Regain for Men iPhone app from the App Store today and start separating the facts from the fiction at regain.co.uk. Regain contains minoxidil. Always read the label. this for? Well, I'll tell you, it's... It, now, do you like brass bands? Not particularly, no. But don't you think they're very northern? 
No, not really. I think there's. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it reminds you know what it reminds me of. It reminds me of walking through um, London's parks in the summer because there's quite often a band, really? a bandstand playing. Yeah. Oh yeah. It reminds me more of uh, Northern Working Men's Clubs. Yeah. That was the Ratstrick and uh, Brickhouse and Ratstrick. Brickhouse and Ratstrick. That's yeah. right. Brass band, and they mm. got to number one. Floral dance. That was the floral dance. Yeah. That, they got to, and that was. Uh, I've just been reminded it was a tune adapted by the late great Terry Wogan. It was indeed, yeah. Um, but they they got to number one when mm. you know, like one Christmas or something like right. that, and they all played. And it's brilliant. But anyway, seen that movie Brassed Off? No, which is a fantastic. Have you seen any films at all? Well, I haven't seen that one. What's it about? Brass, Brass Off is a fantastic movie about oh, yeah. a, a, a pit uh, band. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's, Colliery, about they, it's about how they're closing down the pit mm. uh, and, and how they're making all these guys redundant. But they're yeah. going to the finals of the Brass Band competition in London. Yeah. And it's whether they want to do that or not. Wow, I think that's fantastic. It's a brilliant film. Good. Now, I uh, once was doing a job somewhere in the north of England. I must have been working for the Daily Express in Manchester. You must have been because I do love the north of England. And even uh, though you hardly ever go there. Well, you know, work precludes that these days. No, it doesn't. But I, I will. You, but, know, you, know, you don't do it anyway. most weekends. You go out there every second weekend if you want to. Excuse me, to. we're going to Manchester, aren't we, in three weeks' time? Well, yeah, we are, but yeah, that's because we're show. going to do a show there. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. if you love the north of England yeah. as much as you profess yeah. to, yeah. surely you would go there more often. Well, I'm going to retire there, so what's it matter? How soon? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe mm. four years. Four years? Yeah, maybe. You've never given me that time frame before. Well, we'll see. So I've only got to put up with you for four more years. That's right, yeah. Then you four can... more years. Four <laughs> more years, yeah. No surrender uh, for four more years. Uh, right, now then, what I was going to say is this. The reason we played that is that there has been a case of scuttling and sabotaging of rival bands oh, yeah. in the great uh, Brass Band contest, is that right? right? Uh, Brass Band, Heartland of Yorkshire, um, there is what's described here as a John Le Carre mm. type, um, uh, you know... Um, what? Controversy, really? Yeah, John yeah. Le Carre type controversy. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, when was the last John Le Carre type controversy? Well, I suppose um, the John Le Carre type of controversy at the moment is the night manager, isn't it? Because well, that's yeah, the it's, uh, it's a TV show. That's a TV it's show. That former really. part of um, Porky Vision Porky tomorrow Vision. night, by the way. Will it? Have I told you that? Well, we're not doing Porky Vision till Wednesday. Though. Oh well, I'd, on Wednesday then, no. definitely. Yeah. It's Ask Porky tomorrow. It's Ask Porky. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we've got to decide on the quiz before the end of tonight's we show. We do. So, yeah. Right. Some people were suggesting over the weekend I should give you a quiz on Cheltenham. On the basis that you won't remember any of it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh how, how very amusing. Yes, I, I remember so. about the uh, tip that you gave me for the Cheltenham well, Gold Cup. Yeah, but you didn't remember about any of the other horses I, rem- you I remember that for a very mm. long time, believe okay. me. Now, now then, what I wanted to say was, what's happened is, somebody's been going around sabotaging competitors' bands. How do you do that? Well, under competition rules, players can transfer between bands like footballers can between teams, OK? OK, so if you had a good clarinet player, you could nick them. Absolutely. Mm. But members must be registered with the band two weeks before a contest. OK. A a few weeks before the Yorkshire Regional Championships on March the 5th. Could be cup-tied, perhaps, as well? Well, uh, this is the point. Mm. An email was sent uh, was sent in the name of Mr Whitaker. Mr Whitaker, Who is a particularly good uh, band player. Right. I'm trying to find out what he plays. Hang mm. on. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, Can you hurry up? Oh, yeah, Andrew Whitaker yeah. is the band's musical director... Uh, which band are we talking about here? Oh, Lofthouse. The Lofthouse 2000 Brass Band. OK? Is that named after Nat Lofthouse? No, it's not. Now, oh, it well, might have been, I suppose, yeah. Well, what is it named after, then? Well, I mean, Nat Lofthouse was Nat Lofthouse. Is there a the place called Lofthouse? The line of Vienna. This is a place called Lofthouse, yeah. Is that? Yeah. Now, Andrew Whitaker, the band's musical director, said the fraud was like an episode from a John le Carre spy novel. Oh, yeah. Uh, in an attempt to sabotage one of the region's leading bands... Hmm. Uh, police are investigating fraudulent emails sent to the Yorkshire Brass Band Championships to prevent star players uh, from appearing for their bands a few weeks before the Yorkshire... Uh, uh, right, three of them... Uh, oh, here are, here are. A few weeks before the Yorkshire Regional Championships, right, on March 5th, here are, here are. Can you put this in some kind of order for no, people? No, no, this is great. Mm. An email was sent to Mr... Uh, in Mr Whittaker's name, yeah. right, sent in Mr Whittaker's name. Who is Mr Whittaker? Well, then? Mr Whittaker, I've just told you, is the musical director of the, of, of the, the Lofthouse. Lofthouse Band, oh, okay. right? So, email sent in his name... OK, but I. not by e. him. ..i.e. purported to mm. come from him, right? OK, yeah. ..asked for five of his musicians... Mm. To be deregistered, so so the authorities mm. received this email, right. and and it, and it was supposed to have come from the musical director of the Lofthouse Band, yes. in which he's saying, uh, by the way, uh, I don't want um, five of my musicians mm. to be registered for this competition anymore. Deregister yeah. them, right? Right. 
Now, three of them, including the principal cornet, mm. who was James Whittaker. Well, he's also Mr Whittaker. Uh, hang on, what's Andrew's what name? How many Whittakers are there? And I mean, his name was Mr Whittaker. Uh, was Andrew Whittaker, was it? Well, you said it was Mr Whittaker. Oh, Andrew Whittaker, yeah, James Whittaker. It was probably his son, actually. We really? knew a James Whittaker, Jimmy Whittaker. We did, I think it's him, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah, he's been dead about yeah. ten years. Right, uh, so an email was sent in Mr Whittaker's name. Right, three of them, including Principal Cornet James Whittaker... Yeah. Uh, who is the musical director's son, by oh, the way? Age twenty. Yeah. Age twenty-six. You should have read this before you start hang on, spouting hang on about on. it. Age twenty-six. Were due to play at the event. Another email sent to Brass Band Players Registry. This is the official catalogue of Brass Band Players. I imagine it is. Yeah. Confirmed the request just before the contest. Right. When Lofthouse 2000 turned up to play at the competition in Bradford, yeah. the three band members were not listed as performers. Mm. So the band went on stage, and despite knowing they might be disqualified because they'd been told then about the bogus emails, yeah. they won a place in September's national finals... And they got the £200 first prize. Well, how did they manage to do that with band players? Well, Mr Whittaker says, the following Monday, the emailer sent out another email mm. to the brass band world saying we'd won with ineligible players. Yes. Now an investigation has found that Lofthouse 2000 had been victims of a fraudulent plot. Blimey. And the result would stand. Mr Whittaker, who's a web designer by trade, added, I don't think this has ever happened before in the brass band world. So I am horrified. So it wasn't they were having them deregistered in order to start trying to nick them for another band. It was just something that Disqualify they Disqualify them to from do. playing. Right. To, so to make out... That, I mean, it's a bit like a well, football surely. team fielding three players... Ineligible. After, rece- ..after the Football Association received a bogus email saying these men are not qualified mm. to play for this team. Yeah, right. Oh, surely this is pretty, terrible. Surely a pretty straightforward thing to investigate, though. You just investigate all the other bands that are playing in the same competition, don't you? Well, anybody can send a bogus email, can't they? And they're very hard to track down. Well, I wouldn't they say are. that. I mean, you could not send a bogus email on my behalf unless you hacked into my account. Well, no, but you could invent some other account, couldn't you, and claim that you were, you know, a registered... Well, surely, yeah, but surely they would know this guy's account, wouldn't they? Well, no, you could say I've got a vested interest in this. Now, Peggy Tomlinson, mm. Regional Secretary of the Yorkshire Brass Band Championships, oh, yeah. said more thorough security checks will be brought in mm. to prevent future fraud of this nature. Yes, good which idea. Is, which is in danger of wrecking the competitive mm. element to, to uh, brass band. Well, once again, I find myself quite surprised that you're having a go at people for trying to cheat, because that's obviously what you've recommended for an awful lot of people. Not at all. Over time. Not at all. The incident was reported to the Action Fraud Police team, mm. but there will not be a criminal investigation because no money had yet been lost. Mm. That's because they got the £200 prize. Yeah, but although but there's money involved, so, so, I mean, it could become a serious matter, as they say in the old uh, well, law enforcement area. Well, a very important person in the brass band world, Cathy Clinch, mm. uh, who is chairman of the Lofthouse Band... <laughs> so, Sorry, what's your problem? What's your problem? Because what's I've just read a tweet from uh, yeah. Sai who says yeah. this. Please tell Mike mm. Perry when he's going to tell us something, please get it prepared as I'm lost yeah. with this story of no. a band. No, no, no. Uh, and uh, Steve says, uh, uh, Porky Perry has missed the opportunity of mentioning Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. Well, uh, And he says the only band we want to yeah. know about, Mr uh, Perry, yeah. uh, is your waistband. Oh, no, no. Like no. how big it is. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, let me get to the end of the story here. Cathy Clinch, mm. chairman of the Lofthouse band, really got to the end of it. said the fraud attempt was disappointing, but she added, we will not let this turn of events take away the shine of our success and the motivation to succeed in the 2016 finals which are being played in... Mm. Go on, guess. Hey, eh? The 2016 finals in September... I thought you said they were being played in Bradford. No, that's the semi-final. Oh. Uh, is it, it semi-final? You said it was Bradford. Uh, right, a few weeks before the Yorkshire Regional Championships, mm. which were in Bradford, yeah. but they got through to the final... Which was which took place there in Bradford, right? Right. Guess where the finals been played? I have no idea. Chester. No. Where? Somewhere we've been recently. Somewhere we've been. Yeah. Cheltenham. Yes. Really? Yes. Honest to God. Blimey. The 2016 finals are in Cheltenham. Wow, yeah. that's fantastic! Mm. What a story that is. Links everything together. What do you Links mean, what our a trip story? to Cheltenham. An to load of old to, to, uh, to high fi espionage within the brass band mm. world, and uh, and in the end. Uh, goodness. Well, in the end, nothing happened. Goodness came no. through. In the end, nothing no, actually no, happened. No, it's no, no. No, no. your stories. No, no. So you get all the way to the end and Takes nothing only happened. good men to do nothing for evil to prosper, but it will not prosper in the brass band world. Uh, Sean says this, Porky's three favourite places in Chester, surely the Labour Club, the Conservative Club and the British Legion. Yeah, yeah that's right, uh, yeah. Bill says, uh, <laughs> so would that John le Carre brass band cons- conspiracy be Tinker Taylor stolen trumpet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. I mm. think so, yeah. I think you may have got this completely, yeah, no, uh, completely round no, your ears. No, I completely right. Uh, 
absolutely be completely hopeless. right. Absolutely yeah. hopeless. Now, uh, I've heard a, a communication yeah. from somebody called Ken in uh, Jarrow. Ken uh, in Jarrow. says, uh, basically, that, uh, that if you're a God-fearing man, yes. uh, then you shouldn't be entertaining a witch who's a practitioner of magic and spells condemned in the Bible. Yeah. And he says that's Deuteronomy uh, 18, verses 10 to 12. Sure, I'd say to you, Ken. What would you say? March on. March on. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. The Jarrah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. It's not the French national anthem you're doing <laughs> there, is it? <laughs> the March on. The Jarrah March. No, I get it. I get yeah. it. Uh, thanks for your uh, t- uh, text to Ken. He sent mm. that in on 8, 10, 89. Coming up next, it's time for Winners and Losers. Sport, we are the two mics, and it is that time of the week, of course, when we uh, get ourselves uh, embroiled in uh, what can only be described as a very, very tight contest, winners mm-hmm. and losers. Now, we haven't spoken yet about whether you'd like to go first this week on winners yeah. or whether you'd like to go first this week on losers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so which would you like it to be? I should remind you the score at the moment yes. uh, is six and a half to four and a half. So I've got a two... Yes. Two point lead, basically. Right, and okay. There's not that many points left in the old, uh, uh, the old uh, Premier League season. Has right, to be okay. I'll go with losers first. All right, you want to okay? go with losers first? All yeah. right, off you go. You're Let's right hear your three. Right, my three losers mm. are Martin Demchelis. Who? Martin Demchelis. Do you mean Dimi Kalis? Yes, Dimi Kalis. Yes. Yeah, that's right, Dimi okay. Kalis, who is the defender who was appalling in the Manchester City versus Manchester United game. Mm. He should retire now because young Rashford so outpaced him, right, in that game Mm. that it made him look silly. It was the worst performance by a defender at the highest level in the Premier League this season, without Uh a shadow of a doubt. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And not only is he he a loser for losing pace against Rashford, but then when he actually gave a penalty away, Mm. which the referee didn't give which the referee didn't give, right, mm. he then got up and raised his hands to Rashford and should have been sent off. So an appalling uh, chap, I'm afraid. And um, You've forgotten to mention the Joe Hart thing, haven't you? Yeah, well, the Joe Hart thing is, is, is with it as well. The back pass, which is a killer pass, has right. now put Joe Hart out for a month. Exactly. So, I mean, all those So all I'm those helping factors, you out here by adding that No, one no, in for all you. those factors put together mean that Demi Chalice is the biggest loser I can remember for a very, very long time. I think it's okay? Demi isn't it? Demi Kalis, I keep mm. saying that. Right. Demi Kalis, Demi okay. Kalis. What's your next man? one? Right, my next one, I'm afraid, after voting him as one of the nicest men in football for such a long time, Michel Pellegrini. Who? Okay? Pellegrini. Michel Pellegrini. Pellegrini. Do you mean Manuel Pellegrini? Manuel, of course I do. Manuel Pellegrini, okay? Yeah. Now, Manuel Pellegrini has got to be in the loser bracket because I'm afraid he's turned. And it's all got to him. And now, instead of being the amiable and intelligent. Amiable. Amiable, intelligent, uh, co-corresponding manager... Philosopher. Philosopher with the media that he Mm. always has been in the past and therefore getting the message over to the fans, Mm. he's now become truculent... Uh, abrasive, and I'm not talking about that waving his head and walking out on interviews, OK? Mm. And I'm afraid that that means he's turned and he's now decided he's thrown it all up in the air, he's had enough and he wants out of, uh, out of England. It's a bit sort of Manchester City heavy, this so far. Well, I'm sorry, but I mean... I... Two out of two from the same team. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it right. was nearly it was nearly three out of three from the same game because mm. my third one was nearly going to be Michael Oliver, the referee in the same game, mm. who did not give the penalty yeah. uh, from Demi Kellis, which mm. I mentioned, but no... Did you only it's... watch one game at the weekend, then? Oh, no, 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 I watched all the games. But one, it's Demi Kellis. Two, it is Manuel Pellegrini, and I'm sorry if you think they're too closely connected, but the thing is, you can't exclude either of them. And the third one, the third losers, mm. I'm afraid to have to say, are the Football Association... I've supported the Football Association all my life. I used to work for them. They're a great organisation. But have you seen the production of the New England shirts? I have. They look nothing like old England shirts. Mm. They've got pale blue sleeves. Didn't they come out last week? No, 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 no. The row has started over the weekend mm. because they were officially launched last Friday. That's what I mean. Therefore, for the yes, but for the week ahead, yeah. for International Week, that's yes. why they're so very relevant. Mm. Right. Because they don't go on sale until Thursday this week. Is that right? And then, and then, um, parents are expected to pay up to sixty pounds mm. for these shirts, which are white in the body but pale blue sleeves. Mm. When have we ever had? 
Why yeah, and pale I mean, blue shirts moan about new, People always moan about new kits. It's, it's about the 18th change of, of strips mm. in 10 years or yeah. something like that. It's, yeah, it's, but it's, it's a storm it's, in no, a teacup. No, it's not a storm in a teacup. Yeah, the, only, the only England um, strips which should ever be sold are white, blue and white, as in to the traditional colour that we've always played mm. in, and red, white and red, which is the colours in which we won the World Cup. Mm. Any others, I'm afraid, are nonsense. They're my three losers. I commend my losers to the house. Uh, two from Manchester City and one from last no, no, week. No, no, not, not particularly brilliant. All right, well, they my are. three uh, begin, I'm afraid, uh, with a bit closer to home for you, Merseyside. Uh, Everton, of course, losing at home to uh, Arsenal, despite the fact that you predicted they would win 3-1. Mm. And there was very many different ways you could have had Arsenal uh, winners or Everton as losers. But I thought, really, because Liverpool uh, have were, lost their lead, yes. uh, Everton style, uh, of course, over the weekend yes. as well, to Southampton, you have to think, well, you know, there's something wrong on Merseyside this weekend. So Merseyside, for me, both Merseyside teams, big losers yes. this weekend. Uh, the second loser, uh, I have to say, is Gary Neville. Gary Neville, who not only uh, mm. was booed uh, and uh, had mm. donkey chants directed towards him Terrible. after uh, his team Valencia lost mm. to 2-0 mm. uh, mm. to Celta Vigo mm. the weekend. He then revealed that he wasn't coming to spend his time with the England camp on this international week until Thursday. Yeah, but, right? um, uh, and he's meant to be partly sharing the job, right? So he goes yes. to Valencia, takes this job that uh, he's not really doing a brilliant uh, job at, we should have to say, right? Yeah. And uh, and he's now not going to bother joining the team and all the preparations for the... I'm sorry, uh, that makes him work. a winner to How me. How does that, that make he, him a that, winner? That he's stuck with his fans. He's stuck with the fans no. of the club he manages. No. And also the it's new... not a loser in any way. Well, He'd have been a loser you, if he'd have bailed out on you, them. You haven't waited for the final sort of denouement right. uh, of the story, which is basically that uh, what's going to happen to him at the end of this season, mm. more than likely, is he's mm. going to get the heave-ho. Well, uh, we don't because, know that. Uh, well, that's what the reports are now saying. Well, his friend, we all know, uh, runs the club. Yeah. So I would say that if anything happens, he'll step down. But mm. I mean, no, I think he's a winner for, for coming out so bold in his press conference, admitting it was all his fault, mm. and saying, but saying, I'm not leaving this town until two days before the England game. Yeah, well, I think he's uh, he's let the, the, the team Valencia down and he's also let uh, everybody else down as well who's uh, involved in Valencia. I think so. you'll find our listeners might not agree well, with you on that I one. I don't know. Now, my mm. final loser is mm. uh, a guy called Max Cruz, who's Max a, 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 a German really international. He's been dropped uh, by Germany. He mm. uh, plays for Wolfsburg, right? This is a guy who's had a whole series of things go wrong. Mm. Uh, basically, first of all, uh, he was discovered to have uh, been out playing poker. He won £59,000, mm. right? But he left the £59,000 in the back of a taxi. Mm-hmm. And so he's never seen it again. He's lost that. Yes. Uh, he then gets fined 20000 quid by his club right. for playing poker when he shouldn't have been. Right. Turns out he's also addicted to Nutella. Mm-hmm. For some bizarre reason, yes. right? Uh, and see now that's been uh, he's, he's been named mm. as, a, as a as a sort of Nutella freak, yes. and so now he has to stop uh, having Nutella. And he's also been forced to do all kinds of horrendous things. So he's going to be dropped by Germany. Mm. He's been dropped by his local mm. team. Uh, his gambling habit has come out all over the place. And Max Cruz has basically lost the plot. What a vacuous nomination! Not at all, no vacuous. Nobody in this country has ever heard of him. Not at all. Sorry. He's a German international. Uh, uh, irrelevant to our uh, our program and to our competition. Not at all. Those are my uh, those are my losers. It's slightly different. Different flavour. Right. Uh, we got the winners coming up next. Right. Everyone's a winner, baby. That's no lie. That's no lie. You never fail to satisfy. So I should go first with my winners. Yes. I think, shouldn't I? Yes. Uh, my first winner of the weekend, of course, is England rugby. Uh, we know how well mm-hmm. Eddie Jones has done. We know how well uh, Dylan Hartley has done since yeah. he was selected as being captain. Yeah. But for the first Grand Slam in 14 years, uh, to be done so quickly with Eddie Jones coming in uh, as uh, you know the mm. new coach only about, what, four months ago, yeah. you'd have to say that finally England rugby have actually got something right. Mm. Uh, and they had quite a tough game against France. I don't know if you watched it the other night. But, I did. Uh, uh, they did very, very well to come out of it. Uh, and I think they are, without any shadow of a doubt, the biggest winners of the weekend, actually. Okay. Uh, because, of course, they beat everybody in the Six Nations. Bigger than Manchester. United beating um, Manchester City. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm, I think so. Okay. About the first time in 14 years they've done this, so uh, okay. quite remarkable. My second winner that is... just shows how poor they've been over the last 14 years. Well, I yeah, think no, you're, you're possibly right. Mm. Eddie Izzard is my second winner uh, is, because his tweet uh, that he came out with yesterday, I don't know whether you saw this, yes. today I ran uh, a 56-mile double marathon mm. in 11 hours, 5 minutes and a 90-kilometre Comrades length marathon mm. in 11 hours, 50 minutes. Mm. And whatever you may think of Eddie Izzard, he's done it for sport relief, he's raised a load of money. Mm. Uh, he himself said there's quite a lot of people that don't think... Uh, what I'm doing is particularly important. Mm. And he says, well, they're the sort of smelly people. Well, I just think it's an amazing achievement that he's done something like that. Well, calling absolutely. people smelly. Is absolutely. That, is that uh, a winner? Abs- 
Oh, no, I just think the fact that he's mm. done mm. that incredible amount of running mm. uh, over the course of the last few weeks has been mm. quite quite remarkable. Largely irrelevant. And my final winner uh, is is, mm. is going to go. I'm going to go back to Rotherham. You know, Rotherham are now out of relegation. Neil Warnock, Neil yes. Warnock effect. They won yes. again at the weekend. Uh, has actually lifted them out of the bottom three. But you've and nominated so, Neil Warnock before. I have because I said, you know, when he, well, you when can't he have two nominations in this, two weeks. Yeah, no, I didn't nominate him last weekend. But what I'm saying is, two yeah, in three well, weeks. I, well, I've, I've nominated various people a few a times. Thought, well, you once nominated a pack of butter. Uh, no, 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 I did not. Anyway, yeah, go on. Mm, anyway, I, I say uh, Rotherham, not Neil Warnock, uh, out of relegation. Okay. Absolutely brilliant job. So those are my three winners. OK. Go on. Right, my three winners. First one has to be 18-year-old Marcus Rashford, OK? Yeah. This is the boy who made Demich Ellis look like a flat-footed, uh, uh, washed-up old De defender. De Michaelis, that's right. Mm. And what an inspiration the boy is. 18 years of age. I mean, blimey, people are talking about recruiting him now into the England squad. I think that's a step too far, but what a breath of fresh air. Why is it a step too far? Uh, well, I don't think he's got enough experience to do mm. that. You know, think of Theo Walcott going to the World Cup in 2006 and all mm. that kind of stuff, OK? But, I mean, you know, Louis van Gaal has to take some of the um, praise for, for uh, blooding the boy and debuting him. But what, what a fantastic um, entrance he's made to football. Marcus Rashman, number one. Now, my number two, right... Um, is, believe it or not, mm. Mike Ashley. Is it? Yes, because Mike Ashley has given this fantastic interview in which he said, maybe I regret getting into football. He's never said he regrets buying Newcastle United. But what's come out is he's laid out the facts quite barely and said, look, OK, but I have tried to do it properly and revealed that over the last 12 months, and he's quite right, Newcastle United have been the second biggest spending club in the Premier League. True. Which is incredible. Mm. So, I mean, you can't call a guy a loser. You've got to call him a winner. He's trying to save his club now. He's, he, he's put his billion-pound fortune on the line to try and rescue Newcastle United. Much as Newcastle fans have been against him, he's now proven that he wants to be a responsible owner. Mike Ashley, number two. Number three is Even the one... Even if he goes down into the championship. Well, it's to be seen yet whether they will or not. I mean, taking on Rafa Benitez was another fantastic move, and that really does show him to be a winner. He hasn't won a game yet. Well, it doesn't matter, he's only played two. Mm. But, I mean, to take on a guy like uh, Rafa Benitez and to take the risk of giving him a release clause that he can go if they don't survive in the Premier League, mm. that has got to be the sign of a winner, and I take my hat off to him, admire him, for trying to uh, rebuild the club. OK. Now, the third one, I think this will win it for me. We all know how brilliantly well Victoria Pendleton did, OK? She, we were there, she came fifth. Well, at Cheltenham, she didn't win. She came fifth in the Fox Hunter Chase, mm -hmm. but she is not my nominee as my third winner. No. My nominee as the third winner is, in fact, the lady who did win that race. Oh, I thought it was going to be me for winning the Cheltenham Gold Cup. No, Pendleton. Nina Carberry won the Fox Hunter Chase mm -hmm. on On the Fringe. That was the name of a horse, yeah. right? The problem was, because all the publicity went to Victoria Pendleton... Yeah. The massive achievement of the lady Nina Carberry to win that race. I actually had has... on the fringe as well. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. What, did you win? Yeah, I did, yeah. Oh, OK. But I didn't has... win much. No. Has been overlooked. Mm. And, and I just think it's a shame, although I think Victoria Pennell has done very, very well indeed, and I nominated her as a winner three weeks ago mm. when she got round at uh, Lingfield. No, it, uh, was it Lingfield? Yeah, Lincoln. I think it was Lingfield. Lincoln, Lincoln, yeah. She, no, Lingfield. When she Was got she round, Lingfield? No, uh, it wasn't Lingfield. You're not sure. But anyway, when she got round, I nominated her as a mm. winner. I now nominate Nina Carberry, the woman who won the last race at the Cheltenham Festival, the Fox Hunter Chase. They are my winners. That Marcus wasn't Rashford. the last race, though, was it? It was, was, it was, was the another, penultimate. Yeah, there, penultimate. Was, there was another race or two after that. It was the last race we saw, the penultimate yeah, race. Not the last That's, race, though. last race we saw. Mm. So, 18-year-old uh, Marcus Rashford... Mike Ashley for actually putting his neck on the line, his money on the line to try and save Newcastle United, mm. and Nina Carberry, the woman who beat Victoria Pendleton in the most talked about race in racing in the racing calendar for at least twelve months. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I commend okay. these to the house. Well, you can go to uh, at the two mics now, mm. uh, and you can begin uh, your voting. And uh, we will be uh, voting, of course, until midnight tonight. And uh, you know, we will declare the winner uh, just before the show opens uh, later on uh, on Tuesday. Or Wednesday morning, I should say. Mm. Loads more to come. This is Talk Sport. Even if you are driving high, you've got no reason to be pulled over, have you? It's not like the weed is affecting you. Anyway, you know these roads, and the police can't tell you're stoned, can they? It's not like your eyes are red or you're acting a bit strange. You'll be fine. Except if you get pulled over, the roadside swab will be able to tell that you've done drugs on the spot, leading to a criminal record a minimum 12-month driving ban, and a large fine. Think. Don't take drugs and drive. 
On Saturday, May 28th at Twickenham, the Aviva Premiership Rugby Final 2016 will kick off at 3pm. Don't miss your chance to experience the passion, the pride and unique atmosphere that comes with the Aviva Premiership Rugby Final. Book your tickets now at premiershiprugby.com slash final. Adult tickets start from just £30. The Aviva Premiership Rugby Final 2016. Be part of it. The best news, exclusive interviews and unmissable opinion every week in Sport Magazine. Download your free copy of the UK's biggest sport magazine from the Apple Newsstand now. So what does a good teacher make? My teacher makes me want to put my hand up as fast as I can in class. My teacher makes me believe that I can be the best I really can. <laughs> my teacher just made me realise that not all subjects are bad. <laughs> Make a difference to thousands of lives, including your own. Tax-free bursaries are available to help you while you train. Teaching. Your future. Their future. Search Change to Teaching. Bursaries subject to eligibility. Do you fancy a flutter on the football? A gamble on the golf? A double on the darts? Or a treble on the tennis? You're in luck. Get closer to the action every weekend with Betway's Man in the Know on the Weekend Sports Breakfast with Georgie Bingham and Mickey Quinn. Bringing you all the form on the football, the going at Goodwood, the tries at Twickenham and the overs at the Oval. Every Saturday and Sunday morning from 7 on TalkSport with Betway. Bet the responsible way. Um, that guy used to play um, You Got a Friend, James Taylor? No. Sounds like no, him. No, it's a British band. British band? British band, yeah. What are they called? Blur. Oh, that's Blur, is yeah, it? Blur, yeah. Blur. You would normally say they've got a fairly distinctive sound. Do you know, I never... all No, do you know what? I never listened to... Have you not even got Blur's greatest hits? Yeah, but I've never listened to it. Do you know why? Why not? I was a big Oasis fan. Right. And whenever I heard Liam Gallagher or Noel Gallagher mm. say Blur were, you know... Dreadful and yeah, yeah. Well, they had the they had the big sort of um, bust up. Well, not bust up. Rivalry, kind of just rivalry. rivalry yeah. yeah. I I said, well, I'm going to be loyal to Oasis because uh, I believe them to have been influenced, you know, by the Beatles, mm. and therefore, you know, good guys. Uh, I didn't want to listen to Blur. Where are Blur from? Yeah, well, they're from sort of down this part of the world, aren't they? Yeah, and like Oasis are from Manchester, yeah. you know. So it was a yeah. London Manchester mad thing. Mad for it, you mm. know what I mean? Mad for it. We're going to Manchester soon. We are going to Manchester. Are we mad for yeah. it? Yeah, as you mentioned, not in September, but in April. The April dance the house. The dance house. Mad mm. for it. Mad for it. Mad anyway, for that it. song's called Coffee uh, and TV. Okay, now I'll tell you why I want to talk about coffee. Why? It's huge row going on about the number of cups which are discarded by the huge coffee chains like uh, Starbucks Well, and this is this whole thing about the fact Costa. that they can't be uh, recycled, right? Isn't it? Apparently they're made, because they have to contain hot liquid, well, for obvious reasons cups. Yeah, coffee cups. You would think they would contain hot liquid. They have an element of sort of foil in them, you know what I mean? Uh, stuff that... Um... Well, it's plastic basically. No, but there's also an element of foil to stop the heat an going element through foil. the cup. Yeah. So what's the thing I'm looking for? I don't know. Asbestos type thing. You it's know. Not, I don't think it's asbestos. No, it's not asbestos, but asbestos. I think if it was asbestos, there'd be a big problem. Yeah, there would be. Asbestos. Are you talking about some kind of heat uh, repellent? Heat repellent. That's the one I'm looking for. Heat repellent. Yeah, you know the stuff that... So it's not asbestos, it's not foil. No. Uh, some kind of heat repellent. Heat repellent. It's plastic. But if they were heat repellent, then yes. why do you need those cardboard uh, sort of holders to keep the heat away from burning your hand? Well, this is the very point. Now, now what happens is um, as many as two and a half billion disposable cups are dumped in landfill sites mm. each year. Right. Two and a half billion. Two and a half billion, yeah. Right. I can believe that. So now what they're saying is... Uh, now, Costa is Britain's biggest coffee chain, OK? And they're saying that um, they tell their customers mm. their cups can be recycled yeah. alongside ordinary well, paper waste, they OK? Can't do, they can't do that now because of the big hoo-ha from last week. Uh, you're absolutely right. Mm. And Starbucks as well have got involved in this row. Yeah. Um, uh, what about Pretz? Starbucks, uh, eh? What about Pretz? 
I don't know about that. I don't know how many cups of coffee they sell. Mm. I've been looking at the reports that I've picked up on over the weekend, right. OK? Right. Now, only one in every 400 of the cups that they hand out eventually ends up in a recycling plant. One rest, in every 400. The rest all end up in landfill. Yeah, but they can't be recycled. That's the or point. Or incinerators. But you can't recycle them. So even if one turns up, they can't recycle it because it doesn't have... It's not paper. It's true. Do you know that some of the cups are made from trees that are 80 years old? What? And they have a useful life of just 30 minutes before being dumped, right? I, I, Why people, are they making it from 80-year-old trees? I don't know. I'm not sure what the relevance of that is, to be honest. I think you've been very fact, unprepared for some of this research. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Very hang on, unprepared. Hang on. Now, last week, I mm. bet you didn't notice, the Environment Minister, Rory Stewart, suggested imposing a coffee cup tax to force Costa, Starbucks, Café Nero, prêt a and McDonald's Prater and others... prêt yeah, yeah, to take action. Mm. However... He was well, what about the sugar down. tax? Is the sugar tax going to affect these coffee makers? Because there's yeah. so much sugar in the coffee. Surely it should. Well, not really, because you, you you put sugar into coffee, don't no, you? No, no, no. But do you remember the study that was done a couple of weeks ago where it yeah. said that in one cup of, yeah. of coffee from one of these chains, and I think actually uh, Costa yes. or Starbucks are the worst, there's something like 30, as many as 30 teaspoons of sugar. Uh, 30 teaspoons. That's before you put sugar in it. Anyway, listen, the reason I'm telling you this... I don't know is, why you're telling me this. ...is because of the latest move by right. the industry. Mm. Now, it hasn't been official announced yet, but those insiders who, you know, I talk to... You, you know talk I mean? to insiders, well, insiders. like the naval intelligence types. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. They say that there is an announcement maybe about to come from, you know, one of the large groups mm. to say, look, if you turn up with your own cup, right. I'll give you 50p off your cup of coffee. With your own cup? Yeah. Well, you know you can buy those things that look like yeah, actual... Silver things. No, no, not those, no, but you can buy um, a, a sort of a, a permanent coffee cup that looks like one of the uh, uh, ones that you get from one of these places. But it's actually something that you keep forever. And where'd you put it? What do you mean, where'd you put it? Well, you know, you're, you're walking to work, you've got, you know, men don't carry handbags and all that. Where'd you keep this permanent coffee cup? Well, you keep it, you, you, well, you walk, well you, don't, well, you can drive with it, you can take it on the train, you put it in a bag, whatever you like, no, if you're you drinking can't. out of it. No, you can't. Why not? You, nobody carries a cup around with them, that's ridiculous. People, loads of people walk to work with a coffee cup. Because it's a it's a temporary coffee cup. I I, I, I have doubts about people who do that. Now the well, thing. What do you mean doubts? Well, you know, walking around with holding a coffee cup. Now what I'm saying is, mm. one thing you can do is yeah. you can buy these silver handled coffee cups, can't you? Yeah, but which they are look, heat resistant. Well, why would you walk around with one of those? Well, they look more. Right. So walking down the street with a mug. Yes. Looks more normal than walking down the street with something that looks like you just got it out of Costa. Well, a mug with a handle, I think, looks better. I wouldn't do either. If I, I saw somebody walking down the street with a yeah. mug with a handle, yes, I'm more likely to think that's a bit odd than no. if they're walking down the street with something yeah. which is actually made of ceramic material I... but looks like a, a takeaway coffee. I wouldn't do either. I would not do either. Well, you don't really walk down the street, do you? Uh, well, I do, but I don't walk around the street carrying a, a cop or anything like that. Mm. But anyway, the point is, why has it all become such a huge scandal? I just don't understand it. You know, I mean, a coffee cup's a coffee cup is a coffee cup. And to me, it's not the problem of the people who uh, deal in coffee. Mm. It's a problem of the people who are employed in our society to get rid of rubbish. Mm. It's not hard to get rid of rubbish. Well, the thing is... It's you... just been made an industry over the last 25 years... But if you think of the ..to make billions... people wealthy and, and, and to ease social conscience... But as you of say... the mass of, uh, of bureaucrats we have running this country. But as you say, uh, the billion, how many billion uh, cups do you say end up in landfill? 1.4 billion? Or no, 2.5 like right. billion. Well, a few years ago, before these coffee shops existed, mm. there wouldn't have been 2.5 billion cups of it's any It's a kind. huge country. We're not even a coffee country. Mm. We don't drink coffee in this country. Well, people do. No, only posers drink coffee. Well, there's 2.5 billion people there. R real people drink tea. You drink tea only. Uh, listen, we haven't got long left, so I want no. an update, please, on the uh, the voting. Uh, the voting at the moment is 55 to 45. And next I'll tell you who's in the lead. Ooh. This is Talk Sport. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Paul, let's ask Porky tomorrow. I'm afraid I have to make a correction because since yeah. I said it was 55 to 45, yeah. it's now 57 to 43. And who's, uh, who, after who's leading? 95 votes have been cast. I'm afraid I am. No, rubbish. It's there. No, you gerrymander this every week. Now, this can't be true. It's, um, people have been voting. Mine were much better. Well, you say Mine that. Were much, much better. You say that, but I mean, you know, you had I two. I don't understand this. I don't know what goes on. You've got a load of people lined you up had, somewhere to get in two, on the early you votes. You had two losers from Manchester City and one, yeah. from, and one winner from Manchester United. 
Yeah. So that's one football match. Well, you watched. I d- it's a football match that dominated the whole weekend. Well, and I they think were the, so. They were the most telling incidents. I don't think so. I'm beginning to lose a bit of you know faith here in the uh, in what. You know, in the judgment um, of what, the, abilities know, of the millions of people who yeah. listen to this show. So you're now blaming the people that listen no. for you losing. No, no. See, that's a terrible thing to do. I just don't get it. You know, it's just wrong. Mm. It's wrong. Yeah, I well, just can't understand it. There's plenty of time I left. Think, I think there will be a rally overnight. There's plenty of time Remember, left. Remember, folks, vote porky, vote often. You see, you're not supposed to do that. The only way to get justice in this gerrymandered campaign run by old MG. Yeah. Don't let me down. Are you suggesting Please don't cheating, let me down. then? You're don't suggesting let me down. You're just people cheat, then? Now, then. Let me, let me tell you this. Well, let me read you a few of these. Oh, yeah? Uh, here's one mm. from uh, Sean. He says, mm. both a great MG gets mine. Eddie Izzard alone, uh, winner of all winners. Eddie Izzard? Mm. Eddie Izzard, nothing to do with sport. Mm. He's, he's, uh, he's done that before, by the way. He's run, he's run 27 marathons in 27 days before. It's pretty amazing, isn't so it? So it's not exactly unique, is mm. it? You know, if it if no, he, it's not unique, no. His party trick is to run 27 marathons mm. in 27 days. Mm. Are you going to vote for him as winner every time he does it? Uh, well, if he does it a third time, I would imagine yes, because it's a pretty unusual thing to do. Ridiculous. Mm. I think Jeff Stalling's going to walk something like 10 marathons he's done in it 10 already. days. He... No, he hasn't. Has no, he? no, he's going to do it for, for a charity. I thought, I thought he'd done some of it No, already. no, I don't think he has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason yeah. says, uh, Eddie, is, Eddie Izzard is the winner. Mm. Two marathons a day. Not even the great Paula Radcliffe could do that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Steve says, Mike Ashley, really? Uh, yes. Is he not confused with losers? No, not at all. Mm. He's, he's a winner for having righted himself and righted Newcastle. Tom I'm, says, very weak winners and losers from Porky. Rubbish, mm. rubbish. Well, what about my winner in the... The Fox Hunters chase. Yeah, everybody's looking at Victoria Pendleton. Well, you said it was the last race at Cheltenham. Nina, I said it was the penultimate race. It was the last race you and I no, saw. No, no, you said it was the but last Nina race. Nina Carberry you. was the woman who won it, and she deserves immense credit. I just mm. don't get this, honestly. It's getting on my nerves. Yeah, Stelling started uh, his, uh, his marathon yesterday, apparently. It's for Men United, the charity. Well, in that case, he's only just started then. Uh, I tell you who's died, old Barry Hines. Uh, Barry, old Barry Hines. No, he, he wrote the book, A Kestrel for a Knave, which became the film Kes. Mm. You seen that? Uh, I have seen it, yeah. Really? In fact, David in uh, Knotts has sent this, taking, talking of films in the north. Barry yeah. Hines, who wrote Kes, died at the weekend. Oh, really? Great film, actually, Kes. Oh, yeah, I, I haven't seen it, but mm. uh, I'm you told You haven't seen it that either? It was a claim for it's... five films we mentioned tonight, none of which you've seen. How no. can you even propose that you are yeah. in any way culturally uh, sort of educated? Acclaimed for its stark visual prose. Or you could just prose. ignore the question. Acclaimed for its stark visual prose. Yeah, I've a, seen it. A Kestrel for a Knave was an instant success, quickly becoming a staple of the English literature school curriculum. Mm-hmm. Won a wider audience through the film Kez you've read in the 1969. Book, then, have you read the book? No. So you haven't read the book or seen no. the film? Who, who, uh, who do you think directed the film? It was Ken Loach, wasn't it? It was Ken Loach. One of his very uh, right. first uh, movies. Yes, Hines wrote the script mm. and the film was made partly in his home village of Hoyland Common. Mm. That's not beautiful. I love northern uh, films like Where that. Where is that? Hoyland Common, yeah. in Yorkshire. Is it? It's in Yorkshire. And uh, only three years after training his own bird, Richard Hines found he was meeting David Badley, the star of the film. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, well, I love all that. Because I tell you who's in it, uh, Colin... Colin Welland. Welland was Colin Welland. It? Yeah. Who sadly has died, hasn't he? Uh, he has also died. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you only know that because I told you he was in it. Sorry? You only know that because I told you he was in it. No, I think I knew that already. Did you? Yeah, of course I what did. What else was yeah. Colin Welland in there? Colin Welland was in uh, an episode of The Sweeney in which he played. <laughs> So that's his claim to fame. Yeah, he played a German uh, bank robber. Luckily, you're out of time. Played a German bank robber. Luckily, you're out of time, so yeah. you can't, we can't go through your complete and utter uh, uh, in- inadequate knowledge of movies. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> we are the two mics. Look at the light! Don't forget to come back tomorrow for another sparkling, as busy as a bottle of champagne, podcast from the two mics. So if you're watching ITV Plus One... Yes. Right, and it's 7 o'clock yes. in, uh, on the show... Yes. It's actually what? 6 o'clock. Is it? Is that minus one? Minus one, because ITV plus one is an hour later. Yes, it is. You're watching it an hour later. Mm. It's seven o'clock. But well, it starts an hour later. Why would it? I have been watching ITV plus one? I have no idea. Exactly. I don't know why you do anything. Yeah, that, you know, it could be it's ITV plus one, but I can't imagine how I could have got to ITV mm. plus one. Yeah. I better apologise to the TV <laughs> station concern <laughs> for alleging that they got their clock wrong yeah. if they didn't. I know this poem very, very well. It's, it's called uh, Daffodils. I wonder, I learned, I wonder, hang on. If you love the Two Mics podcast, you'll love the live show. Weekday overnights from 1am 
on DAB Digital Radio and 1089 and 1053 AM and via the TalkSport app. TalkSport, your Premier League station with exclusive commentaries every weekend. What an absolute corker. Talk sport. So I've only got to put up with you for four more years. That's right, yeah. Then you four can... more years. Four <laughs> more years, yeah. 